Folks, episode 50. Can you see me? 5 So we said to you on the last episode, we're going to have some special guests on, and it's going to be a banger of a show. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it, so we got Nick and Brad instead. (laughs) 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 So they're here. First time, I believe. This is a first. They've never actually done anything together. What? Ever? I I thought they were combo together. (laughs) Well, we'll we'll get into that. Guys, uh, so we've got, yeah, I just want to say thank you. Reed. Yes. No. Okay. First of all, it's great to see you, Scott, Nick, and Terry. Great to see you, boys, and congratulations, Scott and Terry, on your fiftieth show. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, podcast with you all. Thank and you. We're going to have some interesting conversation, I'm sure. Thank you, Oops. sir. Nick. Oops. Any intro? Yeah. Good morning, world. Hello. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I'm just going to be the supporting act here for Judd Reed. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've, I've just come to hold the camera to take pictures of Judd. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, talk about taking pictures. I should take a photo of this. this yeah. Is, uh, Actually, you're right. Should I should a, take... We should get a screenshot. Definitely. Get do a screenshot. screenshot. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Got it. So what, Judd, what time? Like, um, your guns, man. You're, you're looking a bit skinny there today. I don't know what to do. He has lot, he's lost a lot of weight, haven't he? It looks like he's yeah, not training. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what time what time is it in Japan? Well, so it's almost 8 30 now. So I could say good morning, world. That's fine. I literally I'm was it. late for this podcast. Hey, oh, Sorry, guys. Hi, oh, guys. Oh, hi, oh, hi, oh. And uh, Judge, what time is it with you? Well, here it's like nearly 10 30 in the morning. Nice. And up in Alaska, what time is it up there? In Toronto, it is 6.25 p.m. Just finished work. Literally just rolled out of meeting into this. And here yeah. at the heart of the British Empire. Oh, Jesus. It's 11, <laughs> 11.23 at night. That's a nice oh, intro. Cool. So, All you know, right. we just finished, me and my, my, my fiance, we just finished watching the last episode of The, the Last Kingdom. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, Uhtred, son of Uhtred with a son called Uhtred. Uh, that show yeah. is hilarious, man. It's all like the Danish Viking stuff. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. Have you watched, so if we're getting on the Vikings, have you watched the proper series of Vikings? <laughs> no, but I was happy. Whoa, to- whoa, whoa, right. Good that. night, folks. Oh, Nick, you got to watch that. It is okay. good, though. Okay, we'll get into that next one. I just, I was, it was really hilarious because the show's about how horrible the Danish people are. (laughs) The Danes, Danes, the Danes are bastards all through history. But wait a minute, aren't you Greek? (laughs) Yeah, I thought you were Greek. Tech, well, I am. Technically, I'm Greek American (laughs) Danish, all of them. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to help them. Half Spartan, half Viking. That's a nice mixture to go. <laughs> that's that's a and mixture. My middle name is Dionysius. I'm pretty Greek, okay? <laughs> Dionysius. Why do we? Why do we not know your middle name is Dionysius? Well, now you do. <laughs> you know what Dionysius I... is? What? The king of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> Awesome. I think you. I think you should have gone with Dionysus rather than <laughs> yeah. right. Just yeah, I mean, what a name. <laughs> Dion- yeah. well, no, Dionysus, Dionysus literally was one of the thirteen gods that Zeus hid inside his thigh when Kronos came to destroy the world. Mm. So when he when he slid up, opened his thigh, and let all these thirteen sons and, and daughters out, um, Dionysus gave uh, horses to mankind. And also wine, which is you know alcohol, um, to be drunk in happy times and sad times. So nice. there you have it. Generally speaking, he was famous for orgies and 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 sex and drugs. And drugs. Wow! <laughs> Super nice. luck. What? Hmm? Jed, if you, you uh, were, yeah. You got any interest in middle names, Jed? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't compare Scott? to that. I actually, you got a middle name? I actually go by my middle name. My middle name is Scott. What's your first oh, name? Oh, uh, I have three names, actually. Blair Scott Thomas. Your first name is Blair? Yep, Blair Scott Thomas. That's a Thomas. girl's name. 
Yep. <laughs> That's a girl's name. <laughs> You're such a sexist prick. <laughs> my, Women, my, you can my, all direct your comments towards Terry directly. I'll send out his private information after. My middle name is actually Lee. No way. Lee. That's that's the, that's yeah. a last name. It's not even a first name. Jesus. No, no. It, my my name is Terence Lee Burkett, and my middle name was Lee after Bruce Lee. Oh, shut up! It was no, not. no, no. I was born. I was born in 1980, so Bruce Lee was all the rage at the time, and my sister wanted my middle name to be Lee after Bruce Lee. I don't believe it. Honest truth. Honest truth. Don't believe it. Oh, I what about Bruce? You could have been Bruce. Yeah, exactly. Right. Bruce. Uh, Bruce wouldn't have sounded so good, though. Terry Bruce. I'm going to ask your mother. I'm going to talk to your mother about it. <laughs> my mother's dead, Scott. <laughs> oh, my God. Why would you bring that up? <laughs> yeah, why did you bring that up? His adopted, oh, his adopted mother is still <laughs> alive, and I'm going to talk to her and ask her. Scott's such a bastard, yes. <laughs> he thinks I don't know the story, but I do. <laughs> All right, I think Jesus, I come on. Story. Get on with it then. Right. Yeah. We've got, let's get this right now. Let's get this. Let's, let's, lay, the, let's lay the ground <laughs> for people. So on the show tonight, we've got the first ever Westerner to graduate the Ushideshi program in Hombu. And we've got true. the second ever and last Westerner to graduate the Ushideshi Hombu program. And then two other guys. <laughs> I think that's a. I think that's a. That's one. That's right. a hard one to beat. I'm going to start. With I'm bringing over question. my little buddy. I'm going to start with the first question. Okay, I got to see what Nick's pulling out here. What are you pulling out oh, there? Oh yeah! Oh, cool. oh, oh, I yes. see. I that see those. Awesome. They look awesome. Ooh. This, this. <laughs> Love it. Kick in the head. There you go. I got my own action figure. I would literally oh, use that as a weapon. That's awesome. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a whole collection of those, isn't there? Yeah, there's I just noticed K, you the K1 yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah. There's a Sam Greco, Andy Hoog, um, you know, Mike Bernardo, Arnis the Who's. What about yeah, you? Did you get one? What do you mean? Did I go? Oh, no. He just showed you his. You're not watching the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Scott, what is that? There he is, look. Oh. All right, Got my the goatee. Is that the go- Nick, is that with the goatee? Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 on. That's with this little unreal. designer stubble. Look oh, at that's it. Oh, that's awesome. It looks, like it looks exactly like you. Just leave that image there. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Just leave it up there. He speaks we can for do me now. Because they, yeah. they, they were for sale, wasn't they? You could buy those, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, they were like, there was a specific number made. This was 2002. When they made them, um, so how, how many of those did you buy? It even All says Nicholas Pettis on the belt and Kyo Shinkai Khan. Uh, I only have one. Oh shit! They oh. really have the they have the belt engraved too with your name. Yeah. yeah oh wow, so, that's pretty cool. But it's, but it's it's like on the belt. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. This is Japan uh, now. Japan Japan don't fuck about with details. That's Nicholas cool. Pettis and it says Kyo Shinkai Khan on the belt. So yeah. Awesome. Uh, I want to know when did you two last train together? Whoa! Last week, last week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm still trying to kick my been, ass. Yeah, <laughs> what, when would it have been? It would have been in the nineties. Just be probably about, I don't know, maybe six months before the ninety-six board tournaments. When I was came back to, uh, I don't know, Nick. I think about that time. Do you think? Uh, the world tournament was in ninety-five. Ninety-five. And you fought, and I fought, mm-hmm. and so you must have been in Japan before the world tournament. So we must yeah. have trained there, just a little bit, maybe a few sessions. And then you went off to yeah. Sweden, I think, after that. Yeah, I remember you taking the class one time, and you were, you were just a beast. And I think it was like three months before something like that. Yeah, and that was a. Uh, so it was more actually. We were during the summertime, and you know, uh, Shian Hen- uh, Henny from South Africa was there. Henny Bossman. Yes. Remember that, Nick? And he was there. That was that yeah. class. Yeah. So you remember Sh- so Shian I... Henny is the hu- he's a big, yes. big, bold South African yes. guy. That's right. He was there. Is that the class, class where I kicked him in the head? I remember that, I remember <laughs> that class. 
Sorry, I want to hear Nick. Did you, what? You kicked him in the head. Yeah, I think I kicked him in the head that class. And he's like, why are you not fighting in the world tournament? That, no, that's a different class. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a class. This is, and Judd and I were in this class. No, no, this is when I was still Uchiyashi. And there was some branch chief. I think it was the one you're talking about class, that class. Was, I think it was Vinny Bossman. And I kicked him in the head. And he was like, why are you not fighting in the world tournament? And I was like, uh. I'm not ready. <laughs> and he's like, not, oh, no, not good ready. enough. Yeah, not good enough. Yeah. No, um, I should, I don't remember that class. Um, mm. so, so is it so that so it's been then like 28 years since you've trained together? A long yeah. time. Yeah. That's long time. that's a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, folks, to... next year, 2023. We're doing the camp, Uchideshi camp in Britain with Judd and Nick. In Britain. I like that it's in in Britain. Britain. (laughs) Look at Nick's face. (laughs) In Britain. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. That's my thought. There we go. Let's go. Yeah, you can come to Britain because we haven't got any vax bollocks. You can just come here. (laughs) We can't go. We can't go to Australia. We won't go to Japan. We'll go to Japan. I won't let anyone in. Yeah, that's true. So in Japan, you were down to a a seven-day quarantine now. It's down from 14 days to 10 days to seven days. So we're Mm -hmm. hoping it's going to go down further. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just just in the ass. You can't, yeah. To travel right now is just bonkers. But I thought we were going to Australia in 2023. I mean, Cameron Quinn invited me to a camp over there, down there. Oh, yeah. 2023. Me Me and Scott won't be able to go. Why? I mean, how do you know? I mean, policy is going to change. Well, the if that, well, we I, we're hoping things are going to change and things are going to open up. Let's yeah. hope and get back to some some normality. Let's hope it'll be fine. Well, I mean, we are getting married on September twenty third, and we've got a lot of people coming over from overseas. Judd said he would come if it's possible, and <laughs> you know, you guys are welcome to join also. But um, uh, yeah, we're we are. To set up a wedding. We party. were officially yeah. invited to the wedding in Japan. Absolutely. Record did so you can't renege on that agreement. I will be coming out. Actually, if you want to come, just send me a message. I'll put you in the list, but you have to pay for your own things. It's not pay for the second of report. It's the wedding. You're invited, but you have to pay for everything yourself. (laughs) Is the wedding going to be in Rapongi? Some of it, yeah. Because I got some some bad experiences in Rapongi. (laughs) Terry thinks he's still banned. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Well, to be honest, Scott, we we're, we get rented out. a place. We rented a place where we're we're having like a you know a ceremony on the rooftop, and then we go downstairs, and then we have like something to eat, and then we cool. go back up, and we've got a live band uh, playing rock and roll music until twelve o'clock at night, and it doesn't cool. get any better than that. Yeah. Oh, awesome! When is this? September next year or this year? Twenty third this year. This year, September. September, yeah. Was that men in September? But I mean, my wife has got like family all over the world. Um, she's got eleven siblings, so she's got some in America and some in Australia. And we're hoping. I've got brothers. My brother's in Denmark, and his his son is uh, are coming from Denmark. We got um, a good old friend, uh, uh, Frederick uh, from Sweden, is coming. Mm-hmm. Him and his girlfriend. So it's it's like a worldwide thing. We're just hoping that. By that time, you know, the restrictions for, because right now they put you in a hotel for three days, like, and mm-hmm. then you have to still quarantine for another 10 days mm-hmm. in your house. And it's yeah, just retarded. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. Well, I actually did my ancestry.com and I'm 0.12% Viking. So we're basically related. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm six. I think after watching the Vikings, everybody's like, wow, I'm a little bit of Viking. <laughs> Every everyone is chasing. I, I got zero point zero zero one two percent Viking in me. Everyone's claiming they got some Danish in them. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, and I bet everyone's had a bit of Danish in them in Japan. Or would they <laughs> like? <laughs> uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> so, all right. On the, on the subject of karate. What year? So, Jed, you were in Hombu first. What year did you go to Hombu? 1990. 1990. 1990. Nick was 91. You, you were oh, a year 91. behind then, wasn't you? Yep. I, I arrived in March 27th, 
And what were what was your impressions of Judd at that time? Because you came in there, so there would have been how many people were speaking like Westerners that were speaking English in Humbu at that time? Because I would imagine it's probably mostly Japanese there. So it would have been Judd. Who else was there that was Western? When I first got there, uh, there was there was actually a really good stable of non-Japanese, probably the most foreign uchidashi ever okay. in Japan at the time. Mokaram was the third year; he mm-hmm. was above Judd. Mm-hmm. And then Judd and Ligo mm-hmm. were in his year. Mm-hmm. And then when I joined, um, Todd, <laughs> this guy Todd <laughs> and I joined from, uh, he was Australian, uh, joined at the same time. So at one point, very short time though, there was uh, Mokoram as a third year, Judd and Ligo as second years, and then there was me and Judd as first years. So there was, uh, yeah, five of us. Who is the Todd one. person? Sorry? Who, did you, you said there was another person from Australia, Todd? Or something? Yeah, Todd. I think his name is Todd Reeves. I forget his last name. <laughs> no, Todd it's not. Reeves. It's not. It's not Todd Reeves. <laughs> Todd Reeves. No, no, no. Todd, Reeves, Todd, Todd Reeves is our friend. It's a friend of ours. Oh, yeah, but that's no, going to be Todd awesome. <laughs> that you said that. No, that was a nice little plug out to Todd. That's not. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ginger sorry, Todd Reeves. It's not you, but there's some other guy called Todd, and he was absolutely a dick. He's probably a wanker as well. They're both wankers, to be honest. I think and, and the name Todd, <laughs> anybody with that name is going to be a wanker, I think. Anyway. Wanker. And then in, oh, let's just go, sorry. No, no, going back to the thing is, uh, and then in the dojo, there were a couple of Australian, uh, not Australian, Israeli guys, mm-hmm. and a couple of Iranian guys that used to come and train. And I remember very vividly uh, Ronan Katz, who still teaches uh, karate. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. He was a really, really nice senpai. He used to take us out for, for lunch once in a while. Um, Beautiful. And, he had a couple of friends with which names I kind of forget now, but there was a there was like two three Israelis and then a couple of Iranian guys that used to train there. So yeah, there were there were some foreigners there. Uh, did, did so you, was was Jandor there? Sorry, sorry. Was Jandor Brezhevoy there? He went in with you, didn't he, Jed? Jandor. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was in 1990. He was there for four months, I think. So was yeah, he there Shandor when you there. went in, Nick, or had he gone? No, he'd already left. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I never. I think I met him at the world tournament, and that's about it. Yeah, so, in '91, you met him at the world tournament, Nick. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and Judd, when when somebody new came in, like Nick, uh, uh, were you guys expected as the more senior students to like either batter them, batter them, or take them under your wing, <laughs> or what, what was the was there any direction there? Uh, yes to both. Yes to all of that. Right. <laughs> no, it was. You know, it was. Uh, Uchideshi time to get a to get a new foreigner in the dormitory was exciting. It was really exciting, you know. I, Why? Because it was yeah, fresh meat. Just for someone new, <laughs> excited, you know, knew we were going to spend a lot of time with him. Nick, Nick was a such an enthusiastic young lad, you know, easy to get along with. We got along straight away, and it was beautiful. You know, we just you know we became we all we became brothers pretty much straight away. You know, you're spending pretty much all your time with them. You know, mm-hmm. you're sleeping right beside them, you're training with them, you're eating with them, everything. You're just side by side and um, there's no leaving it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, pretty much all the time. So it was nice to get someone new in the dormitory where you can share different stories and talk about where they're from and such. And, no, it, was a, it was a, yeah, we're getting to develop a new, friend, uh, new relationship with someone. It was great. Is there a little bit of, so when someone new came in there, the Hombu, because we've talked about this before, um, everyone has like a fanciful idea of, oh, it must have been like training with Mr. Miyagi and it was amazing and spiritual. and um, But from the books we've read, H- Hombu was a tough place. Being Ushideshi in Hombu, you had to fight for your place all the time. It was tough going. So when, was is that is that right? Is that how it was? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So when new people came in, was there a little bit of apprehension of like, oh, who's coming in now? Are they going to be good fighters? Are they going to be strong? I need to I need to stamp my authority as well now to show them I'm a second year. I'm here. Mm, not um, I don't know, Nick. Do you want to do you want to take that one first as, a, as you came in at that particular time? Yeah, your, from your perspective. <laughs> so I, I think it different. would be it would be fair for me to speak up on this one because um, because I came in after. Yeah. Um, a, Judd's senpai, Mokaram, had been, he was from France, by the way. He'd been there for a year, 
And the first year in Japan for him had been very lonely because there were no foreigners in, in the Hombu at the time. <clears throat> That's what was I was wondering. There. Okay. Okay. And, and so he was alone there. And so I think for about eight months, I think eight or nine months, he was just really him. And was, so he learned how to speak Japanese very early on. So he spoke fluent mm. Japanese by the time I got there. He was super talented. Um, mm. He was a hilarious character, actually. Um, he was just like, the only way to say it, he was a rotten egg. But, um, and he burned himself out. Like literally like his passion for karate and, and for training was just completely gone by the time I was there. So mm. I think when Judd and Ligo showed up, it, I don't know, because I wasn't there. I, I, it must have been like a, a lifesaver uh, for him because he had now uh, someone to call his kohai and someone to like just tell them to do what they have to do, right? Um, Judd came in and, 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 you know, he was already an Australian champion at the time. So he, he knew how to hold his ground. When I came in, I was a, I was a brown belt in Denmark, but I started over as a white belt. Um, so, yeah, I was a brown belt, but I never really fought in any tournaments. But I thought I was the shit. You know, I was, mm. I was just very skinny. I was very young. And uh, I wasn't I wasn't used to the, the, the sparring like level in Japan. Like no one spars like that in Denmark. And so when we first got there, it was like the first class that we did. It was it was war. It was like full on. It's like, you know. I'm going to show you who's the senpai, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and I think that this was just part of the initiation. It's like, cause I mean, I ended up doing that to other guys coming in, after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but and, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you can't handle yourself here, then you don't deserve to be here. Yeah. yeah. So it was super, super, um, competitive. Yeah. yeah. Competitive. yeah. What was the and that's not a bad thing. What was the drop? No, no, no. This like? is a good thing because because if you if you were and I was able to kind of hold my ground, um, you got instantly respect. Right. Mm. Like instantly, it's like what Judd said. Yeah, no, we became friends straight away. It's be also it's also because I could hold my ground. You know, he kicked mm. my ass. Like the first three six months I was there, it was like. I could hold my ground, but he was still kicking my ass. And I was like, fuck, I got to get up to this. I got to, I got to figure this out, you know? And it, it was a lot of hard training. And Judd, from your perspective, then Nick coming in as that young guy, did you see something in him? Is that why you kind of gravitated towards him? Like, uh, uh, well, you know, he was a Uchideshi. So being a Uchideshi, they're expected to give a hundred percent. There's no other way. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, Sosai expects a lot from us. Our senpais at the, at the dojo, at the, they expected a lot from us and they expected us to fight hard. There was no other way about it. Um, right. So when I, what Nick was just saying then, so when I think about it as well, when I first joined as a first year, yeah, I had my senpais literally trying to knock me out. Um, particularly Shandor. He was trying, and he was, he was European number, number three, a European uh, number three at the, at that time. So he was a well-known fighter, one of the strongest in Europe, and he tried to bash me, and he had the upper hand. He did. Um, and as, as Nick said, you know, for the first couple of uh, months, my legs were aching. I couldn't barely go to the toilet properly because my just, my legs were smashed. Um, but you got strong quickly. You, as long as you hanged in there and you showed up and you had a positive mindset, you're never going to give up, you're always going to get stronger. Um, yeah. And that, well, that's really it. And so, so I would in, in drill that into us as well. You would say, fight on, you know, keep persevering. And so, you, 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 you know, and that was just part of the lifestyle, wasn't it? You had to, you had to dig deep yeah. and you had to hang in there. And, and yeah. I think as long as you did that, you were going to become strong. You had no other – why would why wouldn't you become strong? If you're yeah. rocking up, you're doing the morning sessions, you're doing the, the Uchideshi class, you're training with so, so how can you not get strong? What, you know. well, what, what was the attrition rate like, though? How Like dropout rate? There must have been people who just couldn't handle it. Mm, I think from the year above me, the dropout rate was like the 10 that joined, eight, eight dropped out. My wow. year only uh, – ours was the biggest year. Our year was only one that dropped out. Um, I think maybe two. Oh, two, actually, two, sorry. And next year, Nick, how many of yours dropped out? Well, there were four Japanese, me and, and the guy Todd. And so... When, when you first joined, though, there was like 10 yeah, of you. Todd got kicked out after two months, and then three of the Japanese left. So it was just me and Mahashi. What would get you yeah, kicked out? Well, so Todd had this uh, this specific uh, deal with Sosai. His, uh, his branch chief had given him a recommendation letter. And, 
apparently he couldn't pay for his stay there. Oh, so okay. in exchange okay, for different. paying for his money, uh, they gave him a job in the office. And then one day, uh, so he was working like just mornings, I think from nine 9.30 to like 12 o'clock or something like that. It was just a couple of hours in the office. And then so he was sitting uh, on the, in a table with his, with his feet up like this and taking a break, you know, yeah. just like chilling like that. And then Sosa wow. walked in on him and said, yeah, you can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like you would. I can't even imagine that. Wow. But what, yeah, but what, a, what an opportunity to throw away. I know. He was an idiot, man. He was a fucking complete idiot, to be honest. He wanted to street fight everybody. He'd come back into the dorm. Uh, being a first year, you are not allowed to take out your futon and lie and sleep on, on the floor. Uh, Judd was a se second year senpai for me. So, you know, he was he could take out his bed during the daytime and take a nap or just lie down or whatever. But as a first year, you got your head shaved. You have to sit in Seiza uh, or, or, until your senpai says, yeah, you can relax. And even when you relax, you're not allowed to lie down. But he would come back and say, yo, I'm fucking tired, man. I'm tired from working in the office. He'd just take out his bed. And then mm. Ligo would come in and go, Todd, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, fuck you, man. I'm just going to knock you out, you asshole. And then Judd would be like, yeah, Ligo, you take care of that one. Because <laughs> <And then laughs> Judd knew that if he got him in the dojo, he would just bash the shit out of him. But <laughs> so Ligo like got in his head that he really had to educate this kid, you know, this young Australian street fighter about the ways of Japan. And so, yeah, one day he just he went over there while he was he took out his bed. And I was just looking at the whole thing from the side. I'd broken a toe, so I couldn't even train. I oh, I remember that, this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That spot. Yeah. Right. So I couldn't really do anything. I just wanted to fix my toe so badly because I knew I was stronger than him. But uh, I never got a chance to spar him, unfortunately. So LIGO kicks him while he's lying on his bed because he's not allowed to sleep there. And this is generally speaking, this is what Uchizashi Senpai do. This is completely normal for us to see something like that. So he kicks him in the ass while he's lying down. Todd jumps up and like fireballs and goes, Yeah, I'm going to fucking kick your ass. And then LIGO's like, Yeah. We'll take it to the dojo. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll go into the dojo and fight. And this is like in the afternoon at two o'clock, where there's no one in the dojo. There's no one there, and they they go outside, you know, downstairs, uh, outside the dorm, and they get to the street, and then you know, Ligo just like jumps him, and Jujitsu try to fight him, right? And I'm just like, whoa, shit, right? I think Judge, you were there too. I don't remember, but I just remember them rolling around on the ground a lot, and like no one got punched. No one got knocked out. And I was like, well, this is really anticlimactic, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so he was he was uh, he was not fit out for, for judicial material in, in too many ways. He wouldn't he wouldn't help uh, with the chores and, um, and and he was given an, a job, you know, to pay for his stay. And uh, I just think he was generally very miserable there. So I'm very mm. happy. He got so, job. Judd, did, did you ever get hold of him? No, in the dojo. I no, I didn't see this, the story. Nick saying now, I, I wasn't there. So, but I heard there's something. Something had gone on. I heard there was some commotion going on. And it's like sick. Like like Nick said, his attitude was terrible. I mean, to have your feet up on Sozo's desk. I mean, I mean, what are you doing, man? So it's good that he got booted out. Um, you know, the Uchideshi life was a strict life, and you had to be respectful and everything else yeah. that was involved. If you didn't follow suit, you're out. And so, so do is. we say like the Ush the Ushideshi program? So, it, I, I from what I remember is is you come in as a white belt, say, and then your first year shodan, second year nidan, third year sandan. So you graduate no. as a sandan. No? no, 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 not necessarily. No, you go white. If you start as a white belt, you go white, yellow, yellow. green. And then in the first year, so there are three tests a year. So yeah, yellow, green, and then you get a brown belt in one year. And then you stay a brown belt as a second year. And then you get your 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 shodan in after two years. Mm -hmm. And then you graduate. And then the test is right around the time of the graduation. So you you they they generally finish around uh Nidan. I see. Right. Yeah, okay. That's like the 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 natural progression for the for that. Yeah. For that. Yeah. So in in Hombu, did you ever look? So I know it was about making people strong. The training was hard. The fighting was hard. But were there? Did you look at the other aspects of karate in Hombu, like the tekumi, the grappling, the bunkai to katas and stuff? That that real fight aspect that 
were in Sourcey's books, the, the original books. Was that element there? No. So do you... There was, no, there was no bunka. Nick, Nick, there's, when we did the Carter and such, there was no bunka or any really explanation of, of what we were doing Nothing. there. Well, Absolutely. Nothing, not. actually. Yeah. So we do you never think did that any kata that was more complicated than Pinan Sonogoura? Do you think then, like the the Ushideshi program was mainly about making you strong, strong as you could possibly be, and then when you graduate, then you would really start learning karate? A lot of projection there, for Terry. <laughs> I'll leave that one to you guys. <laughs> well, no, when I say, well, we talk about Shodan. Shodan is beginner's level. That's when you really start to understand it. Up till Shodan is just getting your body ready for it, really, isn't it? Or am I talking shit? Um, <laughs> do you want to start that one, Judd, and then I can say oh, whatever you know what? I Terry, Terry actually said that question before off air, and I laughed at him. I said, mm -hmm. No, that was bollocks. A bollocks. That's a bollocks question because uh, what we were learning was just we we're, were getting a foundation. We we're doing the basics, the key on, key on. basic, mm -hmm. basic kicks, and that's all you. When you think about it, if you got a good straight right and a good get and washigiri condition and super fit, you can pretty much go a long way with that just alone. Yeah, when you think about it, right? And if you do that yeah. correctly, so that's what we did. We just drill, 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 basic key on punches, get in, kick in the bag. It was just basics over and over and over. Um, and I think with that alone, that's that's an awesome foundation. That's just, that's beautiful. What more do you want than just a strong yeah. foundation? Right, right. You know, and your mindset. That's very important as well, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Good you're building basic, this indomitable mindset. mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say so, Nick? Uh, okay, oh, no, Nick's, right. about, um, Nick's about to drop a bomb. Yeah, hold on. No, no, I'm mark no, the timestamp here. Right. I mean, it's like we we literally never we were never taught anything that would help us uh, fight better in a tournament ever. Um, we, we wait a minute. Hold on. That's a powerful thing. statement you just said there. You didn't weren't taught anything that would help you in a tournament. There. What do you mean? Never. You're, you're talking about not by Sosai, not by any of our senpai. There, there was no one who ever taught us, who took us to the side, for example, after a sparring session and said, look, man, you know how you're moving uh, a little bit too much to your left, uh, or maybe you should, I don't know. There was never anything specific taught about gotcha. fighting yeah. ever. Gotcha. Um, we we were only taught basics. Uh, we're talking um, the basic, uh, a class used to be two hours when we were Tideshi. So the first uh, 10 minutes was stretching and, and, and you know, just, prepare, you know, body preparation and then there was like a, a 40 minute session of just standing basics everything was between 30 and, and 50 repetitions for the whole basic set and then it would be another 45 minutes of of, of moving basics and ido geiko and then it would either be kata or kumite and in the kumite you could be as creative as you wanted to um generally speaking the senpai would roll in 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 the evening class they'd roll in around the time the the uh yeah so it was some, from seven to nine they'd come in at about eight thirty you know they'd been stretching and and preparing downstairs doing whatever and you know they're black belts so they'd come in for the last half hour of the class and just bash everybody up and you know yeah so you got to get really creative like the first time I fought the Razorback for example he dropped me with a with a middle kick and and you know I broke a rib and he was stomping me on the face telling me to say mighty master and I was like, I didn't know what to say. And he's just like, kept stomping me and, and until I said, you know, whatever I did. Um, so, yeah, you had to get creative. But there was never everyone teaching you how to fight or how to get better at fighting. And then when you think about it, it's absolutely ridiculous because if the whole organization, which it was at the time, focused on the tournament fighting, why would you not like put like attention in who's teaching and running classes and how to get them better? Um, yeah. So by the time we were there, uh, at Hombu, there was uh, there wasn't a fighting class, uh, but it started around uh, Judge's third year. Uh, the Razorback um, Sugimura Senpai pulled in a whole bunch of the, the black belts and said, "You know what, Hombu is shit now. You know we used to have the world champion. All the other dojos are like talking shit about us. Um, uh, we need to get a strong Hombu." So he pulled in a bunch of black belts, made a fighting squad, and so they trained. But there was no one teaching that class. It was just him picking up things that he'd seen from other dojos and putting it together and thinking, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And we trained hard. And the reason that we got good and strong and Hombu got really, really 
powerful during those years was because everyone wanted to win. And when mm. you're training with someone else who wants to train to win, you're going to get better. Me and Judd, we were against that fighting team. It was me and him for when Judd's uh, last year as uh, Uluchideshi, when he was there, it was literally like, fuck, man, those guys are getting good. We we, we need to up our ante, right? When, and then so we trained hard together. We fed off each other and, and that made us stronger. And eventually I ended up joining the team after Judd had left and, and that made me stronger too. But there was never anything taught. And I think that the, um, I think it's about time that we put to rest what Uchideshi program was meant for uh, and what the Western world, the whole world probably thinks that what this is, this secret Uchideshi yes. program that makes you into a, a, a world champion. And it doesn't, and it was never meant for that. We were slaves. We were, we were run around gophers for cult leaders that had their own um, agenda in the dojo. Even the bad senpai, the shitty senpais that we could beat if we fought them, they would run around and have us do shit that we didn't need to do and nothing to make us stronger. Go get the mugicha, which is, you know, tea with ice cubes in it and, and then hold the timer when I'm kicking on the bag, you know, tell me how good I am while I'm kicking the bag. It's just like, yeah, we were slaves. Uh, and, um, and because of each other, we made each other strong, was my opinion. I, so I think... It's le- now we've got the two of you here. I think that uh, there's slightly different views on it. So we've had Nick's view there, that view there, which is a powerful view. Would you agree with that, Jed, or have you got a different view towards it? Yeah, I agree with what Nick said, but um, but also well, I think Nick what was a, a point, the interesting thing that he said was about with the sparring because there wasn't really at that time any direct class focused on just kumite and working different angles, combinations, setup combinations, as we do now, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, you had to be creative. You had to figure it out yourself almost. And because we did so much, so we, there was a lot of sparring. There was a lot of sparring going on. So we got strong that way, just literally just we're doing basic things. We would get creative ourselves and putting things together, um, which is okay. You know what I mean? It was wasn't it was not making things complicated. It gave you a good foundation. Um, yeah, sure. You're going to deal with the, the, the higher level fighters. You're going to be behind because they've got set combinations. They know how to counter for this, counter for that. We know that. Yeah, all these things that to be a high level fighter. But you must remember, that we're, we're just young kids. We're just yeah. 18, 19 years old. So mm-hmm. we needed some. We need some kind of foundation. Yeah, right. maybe if we direction. Okay, maybe if we said, yeah, let's don't worry about all that key on and let's just focus on that fighting. I don't know. We maybe we could have skipped some of that and done more concentration on particular fight combinations. But you know, it's the way it was back then. It set up a, a foundation. Uh, um, yeah. So I don't have any any regrets about about that really because that's just how it was. You I was know? just going to say, was um, it just a product of that time? I mean, that sounds like probably it was like that everywhere. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, if you, uh, if you go into a school these days, you see like people have like drills, they have, you hmm. know, different things they're working on. I'll give you an example. For me now, I've got my own dojo. Yeah. Right. You know, and um, I have kids come in and such. I don't do much it or gecko up and down Zenko Jirachi stance. I don't do it. I've got new members. I want to keep them interested. I do the key on all this very strict, make sure they, go, they can do all this. And then I go into fighting from a fighting stance, punching. Murdy had a punch yeah. correctly. There's no yeah. use you walking up and down like that. And then when it comes to fighting, you can't, you can't fight. You can't yeah. punch correctly. Yeah. You're, you're like this. You want to be able to do everything correctly. So I would focus now on good key on and good fighting techniques and be able to you know, throw techniques properly from a fighting stance. I'm trying to create fighters out of them. Right. So, you know, just by going with that aspect, where in Hongu we walk up and sink to the archer stance, which is fine. Yeah, that's that's how it was, and and we spent a lot of time in that. But you know, just I'm just going out with. But that, our that, that was thir- that was thirty years ago. Yeah. So it was thirty you know, years ago, I, I think things that we we can change around now. I think through our experience. Things evolve. Yeah. You learn from your past, but you know, you try to keep a good foundation, but we need to try and add in modern things now <laughs> yeah. to build an overall so fight. Me, me and Scott in other shows have had this conversation, right, on the the relevancy of kata today. So you do kata, set movements, there's a bunkai to it, there's hidden 
hidden fights with it and stuff like that. So our argument now today is, right, well, Qatar was a, a transveyance of information back in the day. You would have these movements, you would show it to someone else because they didn't really have videos and the written book and such and whatever. Um, but today, you, you, you can do a fight drill, you can do a combo, you can do a thing in a video, you can post it out to all the people, you can copy exactly what you're doing on the video and actually bypass the fanciful stuff and get straight to the nitty gritty so do you as both big name fighters do you think that a lot of that old linear stuff then that it's just haven't got a place now today you should just concentrate more on the actual fight stuff let me summarize what terry just said is there still a place for kata <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, you know were you going you know, every, every, we have the, the, the overall picture and we want to add in bits and pieces to get an overall good foundation, yeah? And I think putting in um, certain parts of Carter is very important. Why not? Because you can't always be a fighter as well. Your fighting career is a very short period of time when you get all yeah. banked up, can't do certain things anymore. So you want to, you know, be able to do Carter and, and be able to train hard and, and, you know, put those things into your training. But, Nick, what would you say? Oh... Uh... This is awesome. You know, this is going to be good. Gonna be good. This is going to be good. Nick's, Nick's on the professional level. Where he, when he said himself, when he went from Kyokushin to, to, to K1, he had to forget about all his karate days and learn basically from the from the start again, you, Nick, in certain ways. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this, is, this is a tough one, right? Because so I, I did a, a, a show with NHK World. I was, uh, just thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. About 10, 15 years ago, right? When, and, um, and you interviewed yeah. Kazumi. Yeah, yeah. So, we, <laughs> yeah, that one. It was a series about the, the Japanese martial arts. And the last one in the series was karate. And we did uh, we did uh, Okinawa karate. Yeah, I remember. And yeah. so it started off with me going and interviewing Kazumi. And, and Kazumi has completely lost himself, right? So he was the, the most successful Kyokushin fighter ever. Uh, I think it's six years in a row he was in the final of either the world tournament or the Japanese tournament. Mm -hmm. And so he's won, like, you know, the title, Japanese title, like three, four times in a row. He's it, an incredible tournament fighter. Um, did he deserve to win all that? That's another question. Uh, yes and no. But but so I interviewed him because he he's completely thrown away what, um, what Kumite is. He doesn't spar, uh, there's no pa bag work, no pad work. Um, Absolutely everything that he trained when he was doing, uh, when he was being the most successful fighter uh, ever in Kyokushin, uh, everything he did back then, he's thrown away and he only does kata now. And so I did a class with him, um, or I watched the class, whatever it was. And it was, it, I have to be honest, I asked him the question. So what happened? You know, he goes, oh, I don't believe in fighting anymore. I was like, oh, okay. And I said, so did you go to Okinawa and study all these, these new movements or... Where's your inspiration for this karate style? He says, I made it up myself. And I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to be brutally honest here because it's only you guys listening, right? It was completely retarded. It was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life for someone to go that pivotal and go and throw everything away. Um, and let me be very clear on, on what training looked like in his dojo and also in Josai Shibu and also in, in Kurosawa dojo at the time when John and I were still in Japan and training. Uh, and fighting um, uh, in his dojo, they had a what they called an uchideshi program, which was they lived with their parents and then they'd come in the morning, do their training, uh, wipe the floor and go home. And sometimes if they needed to teach a class in the evening, they would teach a class and that was their uchideshi program. Um, and, and there was no graduation ceremony like we had the Sosa or anything. And there was no like glorified anything. There was nothing. Uh, I don't even think anyone else in, in the rest of the world knew that they had an uchideshi program. But it was existent. And so Kazumi was in a, in a part of a group that had Kazumi, Yamaki, um, Midori Kenji, uh, yeah, Takaku, uh, all these other guys. There was a whole big like squad of boys that would come together. And Hiroshige Shion would sit every morning and watch this class and, and, and train them in their, you know, their moving, Zazen, stuff like that. So he had a specific pattern for moving. And he had broken down tournament fighting into what it is as a sport. Um, just like any NBA or, you know, mm -hmm. major league baseball player, like scouts do they, how many hits, how many runs, yeah. like, how many punches does it take? How many 
kicks does it take to beat a fight? And then, so he had all the numbers broken down. He had a specific set of pattern of moving. And, and these guys all fought like that. And they all won. They were all, he, he made like three, four world champions. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't deny the system. They never did kata. They never did basics. When we got them to see them move uh, on the summer camp or winter camp, or when everyone, when they got to, to call, go for their black belt test, their, their basic techniques were shit. Um, that was just Hiroshige Shian squad. Then we had the Yamada Shian squad in Josai Shibu, where Tamura Yoshihiro, um, uh, Aoki Hidenori, you know, the middleweight champion of Japan, and all these other champions were there. And these guys got together two times a week on Monday night. Uh, I think it was Monday and Wednesday, or it was three times Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And they were, they were in a tiny little dojo, smaller than my house here. And so they couldn't train there, but they had like six, seven dojos, the same size. And so they would rent or borrow this um, this um, uh, basketball court from a local high school, and they'd all get together and train there. They had 10 guys, 10 black belts that had been studying exactly what Yamada Shian was doing, but with a different mindset, video filming every session that they were training. They only fought. They only trained, sparred, did uh, pad work, and that's all they did for three hours a night. And they would video film it, go back and analyze the sparring and talk about it. And so this is like looking for professional fighting level in an amateur sport. Um, then there was Kurosawa Dojo. Kurosawa was one man with one dojo with a, with a bunch of guys. And their training squad was also three times a week. I can't remember what time it was. I never went there, but I heard this and I asked them about it. And it's like, yeah, what do you guys do in your training squad? And I said, we spar. That's it. So they did, um, and I think it was an hour and a half of just sparring. Like, that's it. They sparred for an hour and a half. They didn't do pad work. They didn't do anything else. That they could go home and do by themselves. And so three different approaches. And then you had Hombu, where we all would did in the Hombu classes was basics, moving basics, and maybe sparring. So if you could go back in history, which of those paths would you gravitate towards now? (laughs) Uh, i think uh i think the idea of kata is beautiful i think it is part of what karate should be you should be able to move as a full champion and understand that that the tournament fighting is not karate it is it is a part of karate that is important to do but if you want to be a champion and if you want to train to be a champion you don't got to put everything into that yeah, you don't need to do kata at all because it's it's completely useless. It will not work in a tournament. It will not help you grab somebody and, and choke him out if it's a street fight. It will not do anything with you um, because they are too far-fetched. They are too outdated. Um, but I think they're beautiful for the fact that you can move in a very well way and, and, and it can put you into positions and you can understand your mindset. And, right. and when you do karate, uh, you should be able to do kata because it's that's what karate is all about. It's it's about everything. It's the full package. The champion mm-hmm. is you know someone who gets all of that. Okay, so so that's going to lead up to now another question I have. So you see a lot of schools, in, <clears throat> not just Kyokushin and other ones as well, that do more of the stuff, whether it's kata, bunkai, fighting, whatever the case may be. Do you find that Kyokushin? So Kyokushin has definitely evolved more towards the the knockdown sport aspect of it. How do you both you feel about that? Do you like to your point, Nick? Like that's all you need to compete in knockdown are those things. So why not just do that? Why not just shred all the rest, call a spade a spade, and just do that and be a knockdown style? Or how important is it to retain the the traditional aspects of it, like kata and kihon and all those things? <laughs> Judd, <laughs> well, you, well, you know. Well, it's interesting what Nick was just saying as, as well about before with, uh, with Dory and Yamaki and in their dojo, they never practiced kata. And all they did was just work on their fighting. And he said when you saw him at the camp, their kata and Keon wasn't so good. It was terrible. I remember that too, Nick. But what's interesting now is that now they're in their 50s. Right. They're demonstrating kata. They're making kata videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's and so I true. love um, it's, it's actually another story, interesting story. But when Oishi Daigo Shihan went, went for his fifth arm, and mm-hmm. this is when I was a uh, first year Jideshi, he came and lived with us for four months. And he was, I think, in his late 30s, and he was still an awesome fighter, amazing. But his kata was terrible. His Keon was very nice, unique. Keon was unique. 
his kicks were amazing. But he had no idea about Carter. And I actually showed him the Carter because we always we should actually, you know, we all knew the Carter. For a day. And I laugh because these days I see he's demonstrating Carter Sanchin and everything, you know, he's been doing. And I thought, wow, before when he was fighting at that time, he didn't know his Carter well. <laughs> so, no, but they, they, but that but that shows you as well. They realise that there's more to tournament fighting is tournament fighting, particular way of especially Chukashin rules. That there's rules to that. There's a there's a system of how to become good at that. Um, you know. So, but that's not. Yeah, that's you you, not you can't be a tournament. You can't be a tournament fighter for thirty years. They, that's they, right. You've got a you've got a period, haven't you? You do your it's fighting period, and then yeah. when you when your body can't take the knocks anymore. Then you, yeah. you look at the other aspects. Yeah, or you add. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's what, that's what I feel. Mm-hmm. That's what which I feel. is fine. Which is fine. I just think that I mean, I can only speak from from my experience with with the whole the kata yes or no or or whatever. I mean, I I believe that you know fighting was. I didn't come to Japan to learn to be a fighter. The, mm. There was actually never really my 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 dream. It was it was really that I'm gonna be the Karate Kid. You know, I right. have a, my Mr. Miyagi. You know, Soul is there, and then I'm this. This is how I saw myself in, in the mind. And then you get here, and then everyone's talking about fighting, and it was super excited. Uh, Judd was really strong, and it was it was it was inspiring, like to say the least. It was really inspiring. I started gaining weight. You know, I came at 72 kilos, and like you know, three years after, I'm around 100 kilos, and. I grew into a heavyweight fighter, a strong fit. And it was like, yeah, you know, I got carried away. Not carried away, but I got um, – so side loved fighting. You got swept he up. loved man. the tournaments, right? So you, when you get a little bit better at something, it's like, yeah, this is fucking exciting, right? And then suddenly, before I know it, I'm European heavyweight champion and I'm fighting in the top of the world. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I completely lost myself in it. Right. Um, and to be honest, uh, during those times, the only reason that I kept doing the kata – is because it was in in the class that that was what we were doing. I was teaching the Uchidachi class even after Sosai passed away. I ran that class for like I don't know how many years, um, and then so I had to teach these things, and I kept doing it, and I, I was very proud of it. But it didn't help me in the fighting. Um, and then during those times, also I, you know, when I wasn't training in in the fighting squad, I would pull one of the green belts, um, uh, Ikeda, uh, out of the dojo and and train with him to do self-training. So, and then I would use some of the Uchideshis of the Kohais to do like my own fighting squad. Um, Ikeda and I's training got banned because we were not, we were not black belts and we were not part of the fighting squad. So they told us you cannot use the bag and you cannot use the kick mitts because we did our money that bought it. So I had to go out and buy my own kick mitts. I actually took a loan out um, just to buy my own big mitt. And then we would take this big mitt down to the park, me and Ikeda, and train in the park like like twice a week, you know, because he wanted to get strong and I wanted to get strong. And we knew that doing kata was not going to get us there. So like Judd said earlier, he said, yeah, we had to get creative. You know, we did have to get creative. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, underground, undercover stuff. It was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's very it's much. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, sorry, I was just going to say, but it's interesting. We talk about kata. Yeah, Nick, your your, your Keon and your Kata was beautiful. And you know what? When it c- come to your fighting, your beauty, your fighting was beautiful too. It was very nice. Everything's clean, well balanced, sharp. It was just a, a beautiful combined fighting where someone you would actually say when someone fought, you could tell whether they had. You could say this good Keon or good Kata. Yeah, yeah. it showed in their mm-hmm. fighting. They balanced their everything. They went That's about. It. I mean, maybe is Matsui can't Matsui can't show he's. Key on his part, he's magnificent, and you saw when he fought, everything was perfect. There's yeah. no sloppiness, there's no off balance, there's no. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good that, point. That Watch. constant drilling, drilling, ito geko, up and down, basics. When you put that into the fight and you look at their technique, their technique is flawless and it just comes from nowhere. Everything's good, everything's perfect. It, it everything's actually, perfect. it just reminded me of, uh, since he Darren Stringer. Uh, because he he holds world titles in both kata and kumite, and I've mm. had the pleasure of training with him and sparring against him, and that's exactly what you just said, Judd. His even when he does kumite, his uh, technique is so perfect, and the way he mm. executes it, and the, with the power. And I've talked to him about it, and that's he says it comes from the way he practices his kihon. 
Mm. Mm. Because when you think about it as well, in particular times when you're doing Jordan Washigari, we're doing Mm. a book production, doing this there, it's over Mm. and over, kicks. Mm. That's going to come out in your sparring naturally. A little Mm. bit there, bang, off the back leg, everything's well balanced, Mm. you've got that nice stance there. Maybe even going into a, a sh- uh, your back kick in some way, you go into a Zenko Tadachi stance, spinning around into a back kick, getting a rebalance, going back into a fighting stance. How Nick did it, how Gary O'Neill did it. We're talking Gary and Nick, Kihon, Ido Gekko, Carter, beautiful. That showed in their fighting. Yeah. So do you think then that the, the humble training of smashing all these basics is kind of subconsciously making you a bit of a better fighter because it's honing your technique and then the body just does it like you're doing it in the dojo? Mm, I think so. I don't know. Nick doesn't look convinced, man. Look at that face down there. <laughs> I, no, yes and no. I mean, obviously, uh, you you get certain condition from it. Um, it gives you... Uh, uh, how do you say that? Okay, you know, let, let me like ask you this then, Nick. What do you think would be more... Uh, more beneficial to the fighter, right? To, let's say, once a day, do 25 heavy mawashigeris on the bag or do 1,000 mawashigeris in the air in the dojo? Oh, keep the bag for sure. Bag's better for sure. Yeah, bag's, the bag's for sure. For sure. Always, 100%. always something to hit rather than just in the air. No, so, so yeah, well, so listen to this, right? <clears throat> when you uh, when <clears throat> when you go from karate into kickboxing, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, so that was a big like career change for me. And so you, you go into a a full like martial arts does karate, which has all the or the, the 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 basics, the, the whole the full scenario, <clears throat> and then you go into a sport which is kickboxing, which is only about fighting. <laughs> it's like you put on the gloves and you do you do pad works drills with a guy or a person in front of you. You hit the bag, uh, or you spar, or you mm-hmm. do drills with a partner. That's it. Mm-hmm. That, that's it. You only train to fight. There's mm-hmm. nothing that is um, that is like oh we're gonna do some uh, some uh, some punching out in the air in kickboxing. It does not exist. Not in the kickboxing that I've done. Not in Muay Thai either. And it's just like, yeah, well, you only do one thing. And so when I went from karate to kickboxing, I was like, holy shit, they only train to fight. That's it. But they also have a goal, and that is to make money. So um, here <clears> comes the difference. You're you're walking into a professional fighting sport about to make money on what how you train. Why would you waste your time doing right. something that's not going to make you a better fighter? Right. End of it's story. Not beneficial. I mean, that is really the, the answer to the question. Okay, so that then goes back to another question. What is Kyokushin? Is it karate? So let me reframe it. Is it karate? Is it a knockdown sport? Is it a, an encompassing martial art? Like, what is it? What's Kyokushin? For me, in a nutshell, it's yeah. a cult. It's what? It's a, a cult. cult. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, in a, not in a bad way. Or no, I understand what you're saying. Sometimes in a bad way, but you know, it's a cult. But For I think sure. he even you wow, could even I put don't know. Uh, cult. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think he's saying cult in a bad way. No, I know even, what he, even corporate culture. If you're within a company, right, and you work for that company, you're expected to drink the juju juice. Exactly. You, you yeah. expected to do what they want and go along with it. And I think, yeah, other Kyokushin, yeah, big time, and other styles of martial arts. BJJ, big cult now. I know, but I just wanted, because we have these two characters on here, I just wanted to hear from them specifically to Kyokushin, how it is, because it is such an ongoing conversation around, you know, Kyokushin, what is it? And the evolution of Kyokushin, what is Kyokushin today? Is it is it just like Taekwondo, look at Taekwondo, right? It started as a martial art. Somewhere along the way, it became a sport. They're literally called players now. No different than it is in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You're considered a player. So is a Kyokushin student now a player? Are they are they doing a sport for knockdown? Or are they doing karate and a martial art? Well, you know, I, what we started this going before, I mean, you could say what is Muay Thai to a mm-hmm. Muay Thai person. Mm-hmm. What is kickboxing to a kickboxing person? What is boxing to a boxing person? And then each coach will have a different feeling as well. Mm-hmm. Each Kyokushin person who does Karate Sensei doesn't think the same worldwide. Mm-hmm. Terry and I, uh, I think, in, and Scott, we feel different from our thinking uh, is probably different from a lot of Kyokushin teachers. For me, I I try to incorporate 
what are things that I've learned over the years through living in Thailand for 10 years. I try to incorporate some of the, uh, the kickboxing Muay Thai things that I've learned over there and even basic, basic wrestling as well. Mm-hmm. So my mindset's changed from the old days. It's so completely different. My mindset is completely different. For me, it's about, it's, it's just, it's, you know, what is Chelsea's for me? It's like, it's, it's my life. It's living. I put everything into it. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's, right. it's, it's everything. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and, and things always evolve. You know, you know, we're not, we're not the same people we were 20 years ago. Um, and that's, you know, I think our, chain, our mind changes. I think our, our thinking changes. So yeah. Yeah. I think everyone's karate changes. I, I mean, I, so how long have you been training, Jed, in, in Kyokushin? Oh, since I was 12 years old. Jesus. So, you know, 65? <laughs> <Yeah>. 85. <laughs> how many years have you been training then? A long time. Many years. Well, uh, nearly, 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 what, nearly 40 years. And you, Nick? Well, I, I, I stopped uh, training uh, martial arts, like, uh, more than 10 years ago now so about 10 years oh, ago I quit so I, that, I started when I was I started that, when answer I was though, that answer though was very beautiful we were talking about this on yeah. last week's show Scott wasn't we yes, yeah. so when people say oh yeah I've been training for 30 years but I had, I had a 10 year break yeah I haven't done it's anything like, no, in 10 stopped, years but... you stop training <laughs> so you, you, you stop training when you stop training it doesn't carry on so that was yeah, nice exactly. to hear you say that yeah no no I stopped I, I mean I had my I had my hip, my first hip replaced about, yeah, what is it, 12 years ago now, I think, 11, yeah. 12 years ago. And so when when that war, when that was replaced, I was like, yeah, I'm done. Plus, I it's not making me any money, and I, and I hated the politics of it. And this is why when I say it's a cult, it's like the further in or the the, the further down the rabbit yeah. hole you go in Japan, the, the, the more politics you get involved with. And it's it's it was not it's just not the kid that my mom brought me up to be, to be doing those things. And I felt very uncomfortable and I felt very betrayed and I felt very used and, and played around. Ah. Um, and I was like, you know, I need to feed my children. Is there anything else? I, I can think do this there? is yeah. where, this is where the, um, the different views are between you and Jed, where you didn't go down that route so much. Did you Jed? You didn't go into the professional Mm. world of of sport fighting cock fighting you know uh, and the mm. underbelly of it and everything that goes along with it so you could kind of stay pure and you wasn't really tainted but i think nick you went down that route didn't you and i think it's yeah. it's tainted you a bit towards it oh yeah yeah for sure um i was uh you know uh, for five years i was not allowed to fight in japan what F- five years yeah you weren't allowed. Oh, sorry, did I hear that right? You weren't allowed to fight in Japan. wasn't allowed. I couldn't fight. Um, you, you remember, I was a professional fighter, so the only way for me to make money was to fight. Right. And I was denied to fight in any organization in Japan. Uh, By is who? that is that Hombu stopped you? Yeah, I'm By asking. Matsui. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. These are these are five years of my life that. <laughs> Yeah, they were really so, no wonder so, no wonder you're jaded or pissed off. I yeah, would be too. So back back to your thing of where you kind of feel like you're in a cult because if you could look at it step outside it and be like, hang on a minute, don't fucking tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. Um but because you're within that cult, as you say, do you feel like no, I'm I need to need to listen to what he says? Well, so I started fighting overseas. I went to right. Australia. I went. I went to. Um, I went to Holland and fought, and, and you know, and, and yeah, I did other things. And so obviously, so did, did, so I, obviously, I Matt is coming to your wedding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So did he stop? Did he stop you fighting in Japan? As you're not allowed to fight in Japan, as you're part of IKO, or did he like kibosh you going to Japan? Full stop. You're not going, whether you're with us or not. Well, he wanted me to come back and, and fight for him, uh, uh, represent Coach Shin. And I was right. like, no, because I left because I thought you were. Yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Look, I mean, it, it's, it was very simple. Um, how do I explain? Yeah. So uh, one day he comes, he calls me up to his office. He goes, oh, Nick, I want you to start this dojo in Takadano Baba. And I'm like, excuse me? 
I was like, I'm training kickboxing now. So I'm training to, to become the best kickboxer I can. You know, I've been in America. I've been in Holland. I've been all over. You know, I just beat uh, Matt. Uh, no, I just beat, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, Musashi in the final. You know, I'm a really well-recognized, you know, uh, fighter in Japan. And things are going really great. And then he's like, yeah, but I, I want you to go and open up a dojo in Takadana Baba. Anyway, so I show up in this place in Takadana Baba. And uh, it's, a, it's a Yakuza guy. Ah, here we go. He literally has this scar down his face because he's been in, in a sword fight with someone. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck is this, right? So I don't know who he is. Uh, he pretends to be really nice, which Yakuza do in the beginning, you know? And I was just like, you want me to do a dojo here with this guy? And it's like, why? And then, so he sent me off to do this dojo. Anyway, so I start the dojo. And then I was like, this is all very fishy. I break my leg in 2002. And... Um, and then when I broke my leg, I, you know, Matsu's like, well, okay, you know, you got to hide yourself in your house. You can't show or talk to anyone. You can't post anything on media. You know, don't tell your friends where you are. We want to hide you away because what you did is so embarrassing for the organization. And I was just like, holy well, shit. I broke my leg. And I'm like, fucking, you don't, I can't see my friends and my family. And like, what's wrong with these people, right? Wow. Um, so it started very early on there. I was I was already very, um, it was a lot going on leading up to that that was really annoying to me with the organization. But that was just like the straw of it. Anyway, so I hung on and uh, to that that dojo that I was had, I was being forced to do with this Yakuza guy that I didn't want to be involved with. So I left the organization. Uh, Matsui was very sneaky. He, he called in a press conference and said, yeah, Nicholas Pettis is leaving the organization to do his own thing and we wish him the best of, of luck. But if he ever wants to fight professionally again, he has to come back to us. <laughs> and I was like, uh, what? No, I didn't agree to that. What kind of bullshit is this? Anyway, so he put that out in the media. And I was like, I didn't think much about it. I didn't believe him. I didn't believe that he had that kind of power. Right. Because I was Nicholas Pettis. I, I was huge in Japan. You know, the, the ratings were. You were the blue eye samurai. The TV, you know? Yeah, I was. I was. My name was big. Right. Yeah. And then so. Yeah. Then I go back and I ended up leaving the organization. And then this, this Yakuza guy comes to me and says, well, wh wh what are you going to do with the dojo? And I was like, well, you know, I'm Nicholas Pettis. I want to run the dojo under my terms. And he's like, no, you're you're with me. And I was like, no, I'm not with you. I don't want to be with you. And I said, I'd rent your space if that's what you want. But I'm not going to fucking be associated with you. You're, you're, you're a Yakuza. I don't want to be doing business with you. It was bad enough that he's out in yeah. Ginza and out in these, these these clubs with ladies and talking about, yeah, he's got Nicholas Pettis in his dojo. And I was like, what the fuck? I don't wow. even know you. You're supposed to be doing business with Matsui, not with me. And so I said, no, I don't want to I don't want to sign a contract to, that I'm in a dojo with you. And then what happened was he he said, well, then all the money has to go through the office. I'll make the contract with you because you could you can keep the dojo here, but then all the money goes through the office and all the money is going to go through my secretary. And man, they took 95% of the money that came in. I was like, there's no point in me doing a dojo here then. Wow. So yeah. yeah. And then after that, it's like, oh, I, I thought, yeah, now I'm going to fight again. I yeah. talked to everyone, everyone, all the organizations in Japan. And everyone was like, no, nah, you got to, you got to suit up and settle up with Metsui before you can fight here. And I was wow. just like, wow. Does he just so he has that much influence in Japan? Yeah, you know, he'll call up any one of the other heads. Most of them are Korean uh, related. Right. So, you know, they got this Korean background going on in Japan, which is very hush hush. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, yeah, uh, if Nicholas Pettis calls you up and asks you to ask him to fight, he has to take it through me. And they're like <clears throat> a big, <clears throat> powerful organization at the time. So, yeah, it it was it was really painful to to see this and be in that situation for me. So yeah, I have a lot of yeah. grudge, a lot of like yeah, yeah, doubt about it. No wonder. Yeah. I, I would be too. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Well, so I would definitely be pretty fucking jaded. Well, this too this that. is definitely the, the 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 two brands there. I think Jed, you've been protected, although you had some some crazy times in Thailand. <laughs> I think you've been protected from that that nasty underworld side of it. So you can kind of still have a pure heart in it. I think Nick, your heart's just black. Yeah. yeah so what we're, what, we're, what we're learning is Nick is uh, totally jaded and black, and Judd is the golden oh, oh. child who's very Judd, like Judd's pure. the golden no, no, child, Nick. pure rest. <laughs> no, no, Nick, you've been burnt, and I uh, to, to, to yeah. still say that story and have a smile on your face is incredible. No wonder why you say it's a cult and you have to say yeah. it in such a way because you've been burnt, man. 
Yeah. You just, yeah. That, yeah. How you've been treated like that is terrible. As a human being, to treat anyone that way, what, how you've been treated is just... Uh, uh, and and you, this I is why this is why we wanted the two of you on the show, because you've never talked back and forth like this, uh, you know, publicly. So, yeah. I, and I've, we've read Jed's book, we've read Nick's book. We know that there's, there's two versions and there's two paths that you both went down. And like you said, Jed, you're still very that purist and it's all good and you've got a good heart with it. And like you said, Nick's been burnt with it. It's jaded him. He's like, fuck all of that. Nick's the bad boy. Nick's the bad boy. <laughs> 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 I almost didn't I was, around the story. Wow. Um, no, but I was always, I was always very opinionated uh, about things. This is true. Um, uh, and the being burnt thing or not burnt. I mean, so the book that I wrote, which I just finished um, recording. I've got 30 chapters uh, that I people love. can listen to uh, if they Amazing. pay into the, um, yeah, the Patreon. Where can people, but yeah, the whole, the whole book is on. Nick, where can the people hear the audio version of the book? Where can they hear it? Well, on the Tokyo show, which is my YouTube channel, they, mm -hmm. I've just uploaded 10 first chapters of it. Um, but there are 20 more chapters that you could uh, subscribe to on patreon.com uh, slash the Tokyo show. Mm -hmm. where you could it's only two dollars a month you know and you can go in and they're now uploading uh two chapters a month so probably by the end of this year or oh, the whole book will be out on that which is kind of cool it was really motivating to go through it but but that book is really only about the first three years in japan where i am pure right. completely pure <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so there's no taintedness there um but yeah sosai and this is interesting to remember when when we were uchideshi Sosai would often uh, talk to us about professional fighting and how much he hated it. And, oh, interesting. Uh, really? 1992, I think, is the year K-1 was formed. And, you know, uh, fighters like uh, Andy Hu and um, Michael Thompson and uh, Sam Greco, they all jumped ship very early on and went on to the K-1 route there. And, and Sosai used to tell us, this is, like, this is bullshit. He said, you know, um, real... Uh, Karate is not about fighting. It's not about professional fighting. It is dancing around for money. And he frowned upon it. So if you if you did professional fighting, you would get expelled from Kyokushin. And they all got expelled. What? Are you... Uh, okay, so now everybody. you're blowing my mind. Okay, so I'm very... Judd, I'm cog cognizant of your time too. Do you have to go? No, no, I'm all good. I've actually just pushed it. Yeah, I can chat away. All good. Okay, all oh, right. Cool, cool. All right, so this is really interesting, Nick. So, because most people, I think, believe that Sosai was pushing towards. No, no, he hated, he hated professional fighting because he knew what kind of the baggage that comes with. And, and, and he, so he's like, if you want to fight professional, you're getting expelled from the organization. Wow. And people did get expelled. So when, I mean, we were there to see the, you know, I went to see in Yoyogi um, Stadium, for example, when, when Michael Thompson fought uh, his first fight in K1, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know with a hoodie and everything. I didn't want to get recognized by anyone. It was like it was those kind of days. It was all very like, you know, ah, it was hush hush, but, but it was so, it was so glamorous. It was so beautiful. It was, it was, it was so glorified, you know, all this fighting with lights and, and, and darkness and, and, you know, entry music and like, you know, ring announcing. Mm. It was like, wow. Yakuza. And these were karate people, right? It, I was <laughs> like, fucking, I was in awe of this. And then eventually, you know, Sosai passes away and, I didn't ask for it. You know, they came to me and asked me uh, for a contract and said, hey, can you come fight in K1? And I was like, absolutely. This is like fucking yeah. A. That's like a dream come true to me. Um, so I took that. I jumped on that ship there. But I mean, like Solsai said, in, in hindsight, it's like it, it comes with a lot of baggage. It comes a with a lot of uh, negativity and shit that comes along with it. And, you know, I just got the stiff end of it. And that's it. So but that's you, the same as that's same as in like boxing, same as in powerlifting, same as in world. So there's, there's loads of shit. That goes with it. Nothing is pure anymore. No, once it yeah. once it goes once money gets involved, it changes everything. Um, so if you don't think so, if both you guys are just like agreeing there around what Sosai felt about the sport aspect of it. Where where did he want to take it then? Where did he want to take Yokshin if it wasn't towards knockdown? Um, but sorry, sorry. Before we get onto that, mm -hmm. I want so Judd Nick went down that professional fighter avenue. Did you not ever think you want to dip your toes and go down the pro fighter avenue? Well, it's interesting what Nick was saying. Um, when I, I returned back to Australia in 95, 96, I think it was. Um, and it was been 
a year and a half, two years since Soso passed away. So I was a bit lost when I came back to Australia. Didn't know where to train. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a little bit lost. So basically, I ended up training under uh, teaching at George Collins' gym in the city there, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested. I was uh, doing boxing at that time with uh, some of my friends and um, and stuff. But as, as the kickboxing scene in Australia was very jaded, there were some characters who were running it, which and uh, I didn't like. I didn't like the way they do, did things. So I kind of like just shut it off. I didn't want to be involved mm -hmm. with it at all. But I loved training the kickboxing side and the boxing yeah. side. I loved it. Mm. But the competitive side, I saw the scene in it at, at that particular time. I did. I wasn't a fan of it at all. Um, maybe it was just probably that. It, maybe if the, the scene was different, would I would have got involved? Yes, probably. Because um, you know, as a fighter, you're competitive and you want to challenge yourself. Um, but the scene was. Yeah, I didn't like the scene pretty much. Um, but you know what? You can kind of like sh shut that behind you and you chase what you want to do anyway. But yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't really. Yeah, in, too interested yeah. in getting involved in it, really. So, so again, yeah. so back to the thing. So, if if Sosai didn't think too fondly of the sport aspect of it, if if he had lived, where do, where where was he taking it? Where was, was Sosai taking karate? I I don't think he was taking it anywhere. Uh, this is what happened back in the seventies. You know, it was on TV. It was in, uh, you know, uh, manga, uh, yeah. anime, yeah. and then it was a huge boom, and they got so many students, they didn't know what to do with them. We used to bash them up just to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> and so there was this huge boom. No, it's serious. It's true stories. Like, the black belts would just line them all up, and they, they beat the shit out of people. And if you you came back the next day, then you were fine. But this yeah, is like... I used to use that as well, like, clearing the dead wood. They had to. They had to. There was too many people coming in. It was it was crazy. It was nuts. And the dojo was not that big. So they, right. they, they really needed to wean them out. And so then it just grew. It just grew and grew and grew. And um, <laughs> it grew out of hands is what I think. Right. And then it, then then so the Uchideshi program started at one point because I think it was a, it was a product of of how to uh, do the crowd control. Um, this is this is the, me me like thinking about what happened or what could yep. have happened, right? Yep. Um, because when we signed uh, the the contract to, to become an Uchideshi, it says um, you will become uh, in the Young Lions dormitory. You will spend a thousand days and you will train and learn everything, and then you will become my 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 feet and my hands to stretch all over the world, and we will make a big roar that everyone can hear. Uh, like a lion roaring kind of thing, and and that meant that this this program for uchideshi training was, and often the uchideshi graduates were sent around the world uh, to start up new branches. So it is a it is a teacher uh, building um, uh, what do you call it um, a program, yeah. so that when when Sosai wants to open and expand on his dojos, he will have people that he can trust because they've been trained for three years. To like send them out and say, okay, open up a branch, you know, make sure that the standard is that up makes to sense. Here. So, I, so and you can look at that period as well, and as like a indoctrination period, we're bringing you into the fold and training you up exactly how I want you, so I can send you where I want you to go to spread my karate. So, I just want to go on yeah. record as Terry Burkett is saying that so I had a cult. No, Nick said he had a cult. <laughs> I, I, I agreed with Nick. <laughs> it is a cult. Fucking open your eyes. This is exactly what it is. I yeah. mean, not in a good I, I, or bad way. It is what it is. Yeah. Just break it down and look at it. To, There's a head to, at the top who's got his, his number one students that lives with him and trains with him for three years. He sends them out to open up branches. Here's your pyramid. It's literally Done. a cult. <laughs> It's done. That's it. It's okay. That, <laughs> that, cult, men, that cult mentality, though, I, like I, for me, I think I was uh, of Shodan and I was traveling around going like to Papandal, going to different camps and stuff. And you know, you see everyone is like, oh, so, 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 so. anyone has got stripes on their belt. Oh, so, so, so. They, they're revered and, and treated as a god. But I, I was a doorman. I was fighting every weekend, real <laughs> fighting. With glass yeah. bottles, I was proper fighting with people. So yeah. I had my own persona. So I'm like, yeah, you may have stripes on your belt, but if I fucking hit you, that'd be the end of you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I had, I kind of started to get, uh, to be able to step out of it and stop drinking the Kool-Aid and be like, 
yeah, yeah, actually, you, you're not different than me. You, you may yeah. be Japanese and, and you may have all these stripes, but you're not different than me. We're all, we're all the same. So I could see past that bit. And then, you know, my, my brand is like the Ronin thing. and went off my own path and did my own things. I was like, you two are the, like the original Ronins. You were off and done your own yeah. things as well. Yeah, true. Um, <laughs> look, there's nothing wrong with it, but I mean, it is what it is. But fear is is what is controlling the masses. Fear is what is controlling, you know, uh, uh, everything through history, you know, uh, religion and everything. It's 100%. all about fear and how you're controlling that fear aspect of it. And just because you have an extra stripe on your belt, you know, suddenly you have to say, oh, to this guy and bow down to him. But this is the beauty of it here. This is where I think that there, there is justice in Kyokushin. That is when you step into the dojo or onto the mat and you've actually fight someone, <laughs> you can beat the crap out of them. And then, you know, <laughs> once the dojo or the training session is over, it's just like, you know, you'll do the osos, but you will never look yeah. each other in the eyes the same way. So, yeah, this th there is beauty to it. Well said. Well said. Gary always used to say, uh, he's like, you do your talking on the mat. Yeah. The mat does the talking feel. Don't worry about what anyone else says. The mat will do the talking feel. Yeah, jujitsu yeah. mats never lie. Yeah, that's a karate. They copied it from karate. <laughs> Don't get into jujitsu. <laughs> but I speak. Like I, just said, I, I just finished like uh, uh, recording the the audio book like last week, and it's all edited and it's all done and finished. It was really cool. And I remember uh, a chapter uh, where I, I spoke about like you know uh, a teaching at Hombu because I taught at Hombu for like ten years. And I got like when 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 K1 got all excited and, and I was watching that, got excited about that. So I started doing some like, you know, kickboxing training all by myself down in the basement and this and that. And then, you know, pride came out and pride was huge. Right. And then suddenly it was, you know, all these arm bars and, and like people like, <laughs> and choking people out and stuff like that. So I got really into that, too. And so I just. I just put that into the training that the classes that I was taught that I was taught teaching at home. So I did like groundwork and, and, and kickboxing kind of training awesome. in class at Hombu Dojo. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. yeah. And then I know Judd does this all the time. He integrates everything. You know, the, you guys talked about the bunkai for kata. It's like, what is it important or not important? Well, all the things that you can find inside the kata, why are they never practiced in class, for example? Yeah. Like all these yeah. things. Yeah, you're yeah. grabbing him and you're you're tossing him, you're doing this and that, but you're never practicing it. So so well, this was our point with it. kata. Uh, okay, what yeah. Is this, is Terry and I, it this is Terry and I's frustration. So, <laughs> so what you're doing, you're basically just doing a dance routine that looks good and gives you a little bit of a sweat if you don't actually know what you're fucking doing in it. it yeah, yeah. I, I say myself, like, I know Kyokushin guys that there know 21 katas, but they don't know one move from them what's supposed to actually, you know, the application of it or do it. Um, and also, when I was a kid, so I I had different, I did Okinawan karate and different backgrounds and different styles before going into Kyokushin. But one of the things that drew me to Kyokushin was just that as a kid, seeing Kyokushin um, students were just, Jesus Christ, Kyokushin was just the baddest martial art. It really was. It was the strongest karate. It looked so hard and it looked like anybody could roll into any dojo and take care of themselves. And I just don't feel that's there anymore. That's why I went back. I was asking you guys, what is Kyokushin to you guys? Because today, if a Kyokushin person rolls into a Kudo Dojo or, or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or anywhere else, they're probably going to get their ass kicked if they don't have, you know, a, a foundation in those things. So that's why I was asking, like, is, is Kyokushin supposed to be an encompassing martial art where a person should be able to take care of themselves in all those realms? Or is it just sport focused? Good night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my personal view on this, my personal view is I think Sorsai developed Kyokushin to be all encompassing. Because if you look at his original books, the three original books, the Tegumi, the groundwork, that is all in there. Most of his books is basically on self defense work. But hmm. then as, as the tournament era began and it Or was grew that just to this, sell books? Or was it just to sell books? But it would no, because well, they predate know. the world tournament. The world the tournament was after was the books were written. Judo. He was. He was a fourth dan in judo. Yeah, right? and and he was and he was a good wrestler. Yeah. So I I've often wondered he was also I, a professional wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, exactly. Wasn't he? There wasn't. He wasn't a great toga. He was part of that. He was part he of the, the troop. Great, part of the three of them that went out yeah. touring, wasn't that? Yeah. See now, I I so I've had to step out of Kyokushin a bit and look at judo, look at jujitsu, look at 
non-Kyokushin katas and go back to their origins to get like, oh, well, actually, that's what we're doing. This movement is, is actually grabbing the edge, smashing and taking them down. 90% of it is grappling movements in the kata. Um, go on. Well, that's why I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not a big proponent. I used to be a huge proponent of kata. I, I, and I do like practicing kata uh, just because aesthetically it looks really nice. But I think people forget that, and Terry, you alluded to it earlier. I mean, kata originally when in Okinawa, they gave it to people because they couldn't fight. It was illegal. And you needed some way to practice by yourself. And you needed an encyclopedia to remember all the different movements. So I did Okinawan karate. And quite frankly, they would teach us the application first. The kata was the last thing you learned. It was just a, it was a secondary thought just for something. That, that so was could, the conveyance of information. Yeah. Just, oh, oh, and by the way, here's a way for you to string it together so you can practice on your own, like shadow boxing. So if we're not using any of the components of it, that's why I struggle with why it's even being done. So I look at something like Kudo, who got rid of all the kata, or even um, Inshin also got rid of it and kind of came up with their own based off their style. That's why I was going like, why is Kyokushin so still focused on, you know, 21 kata that they don't even incorporate or use would be uh, money. money. Huh? Money, money. It's money. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. because, it's because you have a belt system that you exactly. have to go from one belt to the next belt and you have to like get some standard to make it different to go up to. So to, to get a black belt, you need to know all these kata. I, I'm not against this at all. I think it's fantastic mm-hmm. system. And as a dojo mm-hmm. operator, I think this is where your, your money really is made. It's on, you know, the memberships, it's on the, the, the gradings, yep. it's yep. on the camps and all that stuff, you know? So um, if you go full time in like dojo uh, operator and owner, then the, mm-hmm. the, there has to be some kind of structure, which is also socially uh, aspect of how you keep your, your little cult running yeah <laughs> um which is fine no because there there's a, there's a great satisfaction of having to train for a belt test sure um i remember becoming a blue belt very early on and i was like super stoked about it you know i would learn the kata in the dojo i'd go home and practice it in, in my own room i'd go out in the park and practice it and then you know the first black belt test that you do you're training three four maybe five years now and you're like super excited about it it's it's a big thing to become a black belt mm-hmm. i love that I, mm-hmm. I think anyone should train for a black belt in their life and go through all the kata and understanding of that and then but I also think that once you've graduated and become a black belt, it's like now you have the tools to, to figure out what karate really is about for you. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So Makes when you karate. say what is what is Kyokushin and where where is Kyokushin going or <clears throat> or not going, it's 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 it is um, it is the uh, Japanese. I think it's diff- uh, different for everyone. Isn't operators it? that are that are keeping the structure because it works as a business, and that's it. Mm. Um, but you will see teachers like me, for example, when I realized the importance of, you know, jiu-jitsu, when I realized the importance of the difference from like when you do kickboxing and boxing and stuff like that, you will see teachers like Judd, for example, who knows everything about fighting. He knows the groundwork. He's, he's worked yeah. on the door as a bouncer. You yeah. know, uh, if you've never worked as a bouncer, you've never really gotten in down and dirty enough you know uh, tournament fighting can be all beautiful but i mean fucking the street is different um and and so yeah so there you have it you know if you have a teacher who has been through all that and, and gone through all that and understand that then this teacher will also teach you you know the groundwork the, at least the basics of it how to you know escape a uh you know a take self-defense to, yeah <laughs> you the have the best to learn. way the best way to learn is through experiential learning so if yeah. you're being taught how to take someone down by someone that's never taken someone down because they read it in a book, yeah, it's, they haven't got the same feel. You need to learn from someone who's done it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think that's part of the thing that like where people message me and stuff and they get frustrated because they're like, you know, I've spent so many years doing this particular style. I'm now a black belt or whatever. But if somebody actually grabbed me and did something in the street, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah people Just don't that, so we, we, <laughs> we in, in into the into the door work side of it then so judd you you had a stint on the door for quite a while which in thailand uh in, in japan actually the first time i worked at gas panic nightclub for like a full year um that was oh good old chaotic. gas panic i love that place yeah um, kidding, and then i worked at Belfarty, which was 
piece. Oh, dude, was, there were two gas panics in Rapongi. There was not. That was a, that was an easy gig. That one. Um, then I worked a number of years in the in the nightclubs in the, in Australia. Nick actually came to the nightclub. Remember that Nick? We had that incident with the the bat, the guy. Oh man, that fucking what? Thing was that. Nuts. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, then. Let's have the story with a bat. Oh, uh, there was a big uh, commotion going on outside where. Someone knocked out a girl. Fighting. Someone hit a girl and knocked her out. Oh my god! Mm. Yeah, and then we've someone, all, someone we've carried all done that. her out, and then so the friends of both of these the, around the girl started fighting, and there was it was a big group, <laughs> and then the fight like it just it just spread out like I don't know I don't this is like wildfire like spreads like fire each it does other, spread like fire like and it was fucking wild, and then they started running. And so they're all over the place. And then this other guy who had got absolutely nothing to do with it. Randomly, I was outside. Judd was like, you know, controlling some of the people and saying, no, don't fucking fight you know, whatever he was doing. And I saw this other guy wanting to go in and jump in. And so I just I grabbed him around the neck and said, no, you just don't do anything. <laughs> and he's like, oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> but then we went out because one of the one of the other bouncers had gotten hit by one of these guys and so we're out there running around chasing these kids down which you should never do if you're standing on the door don't fucking leave the door um but so we went out there and then i was so close but this one bouncer he was like there was standing and yelling at a guy over here and then he turns around and the other guy came ran running out of the bushes with a big fucking stick and just smacked him <laughs> straight in the face with it and i just hear this sound off and I was like, oh my god, that guy must have fucking lost all his teeth there. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, it was a really bad night. It was a really bad <laughs> night. Sounds like a fucking brilliant night to me. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was there. Yeah, yeah. uh, well, uh, uh, well Judd, while you were so Australia, um, so when were you, were you working the, the late 90s on the door in yeah, Australia? We, yeah, yeah, so mid say 95, 90, 96 to 2002. About seven years. So was because Australia got like a, a a biker culture as well, haven't they? It's quite a rough biker culture. A little bit, a little bit. But, so um, was it rough? Was it rough nightclubs like fighting some, every night? Some nights, some nights were, um, some nights weren't. I mean, we had like a university night. I think the, that, the night that Nick came was a university night, which is like you know, eighteen, nineteen year olds getting drunk on so dollar basically, spirit. Basically, Nick oh, yeah. started a fight with all the little that girls was, screaming that over him. Yeah, yeah, nice going, Nick. Night. <laughs> that night I was, was trying to pick up a long. girl. <laughs> <laughs> Just come to Australia, hanging out. <laughs> Just another night in Australia, Nick. But yeah, you know, they were different times to, to now. No one had phones back then. You know, it was, just, it was a pretty wild scene. Now there's cameras everywhere. People talk about, you know, these days are. I don't think that are violent. I don't know. I don't go out anymore, but I don't think so compared to before. I think it was a lot more. Very not different. No, I think I think Very that because I I started door work. Excuse me, late nineties. I was seventeen. I was actually too young to go in the pub, but I was working on the door outside. Uh, so end of the late nineties, I started, and I think late nineties, early two thousand was the end of the golden period of door work, where if it kicked off, you could go out, knock them both out end the fight and go back in and it was fine from about 2007 onward that's that's what we used to do you said like it'll spread like wildfire and it does so if you're in a busy nightclub and there's two people fighting we'd come in and knock them both out and then drag them out then the fight stops yeah that's that's, that's a really great way to get it done um but now look cameras everywhere it, it, I think door work is just a criminal record waiting to happen. And it's not yeah. as rough, like you said. It's not as bad <laughs> to take as everybody's same. like with their bleach blonde hair. And like, <laughs> I'm not as old as, I'm not as old as you guys. I'm like 41. But I see, like I go out and I see kids out wearing like a bobble hat with gloves. I never wore gloves when I was a kid. I'd never dream of wearing a pair of gloves going out because it was cold. I'm a fucking man. I'll I'll deal with the I'll deal with this all night to keep my hands warm. But like kids tonight today, they go out, they dress in their gloves, all their ripped jeans, designer fucking flat cap and whatever. They don't go out to fight. Actually, I'm like, what's wrong with you? To that point, I want to wrap that, pull that back actually to karate. And 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 Judd, because you have the school going in Australia, have you found like what are students like today compared to 
days gone by, if you will, is it, does it reflect into students too? Or once they come into the dojo, is it different? They change that mindset. No, this, but my, my students in particular, they're all, they're awesome. Every one of them yeah. are awesome. Do you not um, see them training? That girl beating the shit out of that boy. Yeah, I do. I have some young lads. Uh, they're 14, 15 years old, especially the girls. They're 15 years old. It's they odd. are terrifying. They punch on. They want to punch on. They don't want to run around. They want to stand there and you can change it. Um, <laughs> and they're incredible. Um, actually, it's interesting. I have some younger kids that just joined up. Uh, you know, little 10, 11 year olds, and they're watching this Cobra Kai. And one of them actually said something, oh, something like a Cobra Kai in a dojo. And I, and I, and so what I get is I get my young 14, 15 year olds to demonstrate kicking the pats. And they're like, oh, they're like they're seeing the real, they're real, seeing the real deal, you know? So, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, like in the dojo we were talking about before, how, how our students these, these days, um, Scott, is that we develop, that's what we we're about, we're developing character. Yeah. We're developing a strong, a strong attitude. So however they come in, we're like, right, we're going to turn these guys into warriors. That's my mindset. I want to turn them into warriors. I want them to turn them into humble warriors. Good kids, good natured kids, but absolute warriors through and through. And that can be through to the adults as well. You know, even in the, the adults who are joining up in the 40s and 50s, I'm going to turn them into machines. Oh, yeah. Side me up. I know. Side See, isn't that inspiring? Was, That's yeah, fucking. They're inspiring. I've got some ones in their 40s. These guys are punching on. And they've, they've got like three kids and stuff. I'm like, they're beautiful. No, the that's well, it that's says, cool. says on your ability, though, doesn't it? Jakarta, lessons for life, life learning. Yeah, it's training for And life. I think ka- karate, like same with my kids, like we, 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 have, like we have a lesson and then the stuff, the question they're asking, and I'm like, I'm not your fucking guidance counselor, yeah? We, we, <laughs> let's do some push ups, shall we? Because the stuff we yeah, go yeah. through, and I think we do, as instructors, we have a responsibility to mold the younger kids and to get them to go down an avenue where they're not just going to be strong. They're not just going to be good fighters. They're going to be good people. They're going to be morally yeah, right. good, morally strong. See, that's why yeah. I love everything that Judd was just saying then, like, and going back to what we were talking about was Chokshin and stuff like that. It's one thing to turn out students that have great Kihon or great Kata or great fighters or whatever the case. But if you could turn out students that are mentally prepared for life, that's mm. a completely different game. And Judd, like what you're saying there now, they're coming out as like, you know, you're creating warriors. That's not going to be mm. just in the martial arts. That's going to be in every aspect of their life. Yeah, that's it. Mm. That's it. That's what we try to do. Yeah. Develop good so Nick, people with the warrior mindset. Yeah. Nick, have you, have you got a dojo running? I know you've got... Uh, the he's in media and entertainment now. Hence why he's, you know... He's a famous actor. <laughs> <laughs> How, have you got have you got a dojo in in Rapongi? No, I don't. Okay. No. Well, that's uh, where he is. He's in yeah, Rapongi. No, no, we're down the down the corner from Rapongi, really close to Rapongi though. Yeah, that's that's uh, Rapongi to me. Yeah, we're in Nishazabu. <laughs> it, yeah, it's like a 5 minute walk to Rapongi. But um no, I don't have a dojo, but last year about a year, year and a bit ago, um the the current under 90 kilo k1 champion who's yeah uh, fighting out of iran his name is sina kamirian uh came to me and asked me for for help because you know he's training in japan and he's got no one to spar with and he's got no one to mentor him and you know i was like yeah sure okay you know so i got excited about that because you know it was like 10 years i've been out of martial arts and if someone's going to pull me back in to do something, it will be the champ, right? <laughs> yeah. So I started training him um, two, three times a week. And uh, he's now overseas, but he's coming back uh, next month. And uh, yeah, we, I'm, yeah, I've been, I've been working with him for about a year. But it's, and it was kind of funny because I thought maybe that it would pull me back into doing stuff. And I thought maybe, I'd, you know, start sparring again. And, and the truth is, I, I bought all the equipment and I bought the mouthpiece. I bought the gloves, the shin pads, and everything. I did combinations with him, and I was like, "Yeah, I can kind of move, but also everything hurts." Like, <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> everything hurts again, uh, and not in a good way. And I was so. Just how, like, how old? Yeah. How old are you now, Nick? I just turned forty nine. Forty nine. I judge you. You're forty eight. No, you have you turned fifty yet? I'm fifty. Yeah, I'm fifty. And Scott's sixty, and I'm thirty two. <laughs> so. It's a good, got a good mix of age. But it ain't. I'm, I'm 51, like, but I read at a 52 year old level. But it, you're in the 50s, so we're all like 
although I'm about a decade off, you're only f- like on 50, your body's yeah. different, isn't it? And your body fucked up. And, and thing like little niggly bits, like that would never have ever have stopped you in the past. You're like, fuck's yeah. sake, my, it's just not healing. My yeah. hand's not healing. It's, it's been the like healing, three months yeah. is still swollen. Fucking healing, yeah. I don't deal very well with pain. <clears throat> <clears throat> No, it's true. I, I've, I've come to realize this. Uh, the older Coming from a guy who spent his life in karate and then CrossFit. I don't deal well with pain, exercise. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's very true. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, man, I broke a rib uh, on, on January the 1st uh, by playing with a child. I was like lifting this little girl up and down, having fun. And I slipped on the floor and I fell down and I, 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 I my, my rib... <laughs> hit this box's edge right on the rib and so i cracked the rib right and it was fucking painful and i have not been in so much pain in like over a decade and i was just like oh my god ribs suck i really don't deal well with pain so anyway i mean going back to training with sheena was like yeah i i ended up figuring out how i could pull in other people to train with him instead of me having to do the work because i was like, doing I it. deal with the pain again yeah uh, i had no idea that like, Pettis was such a pussy but it's good to know. <laughs> Makes me feel more human. <laughs> and I couldn't. I, it, I just got back in. I took. I took a month off, not training for a month because of How, the pain. What? Okay. A karate aside, for this question is for both of you because you both have gone through it. What are your hips like? Now, I know you've gone through the replacements. Yeah. For me. Well, Nick got um, two hips. I got two hips. Two new yeah. hips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got the first one done like long, long time ago. And then the second one done. So the first one I still have problems with if I run. Okay. It's only running. It's only like, <clears throat> to be honest at this weight that I'm, I'm trying to lose weight now. So um, the, to see if I can be able to run again, but if I do more than two minutes of running, like jogging or thumbs, then the left hip starts the pain. Gotcha. Um, but I could do anything else, uh, lifting heavy things, uh, wall balls, squats, uh, anything else but running. Jump so rope is fine. Biking, hip, everything. The hip mobility is still there? Yeah, fine. Cool. And Judd? No, Nick, uh, well, Nick's this, he just said fine. Nick's like a ballerina. Have you seen him stretch? Oh, yeah, I know. He I've can seen do, he, can, he can do the full splits. Yeah. He can do things when I'm like, which is like a. Uh, like a, a kid can do with his t- he feet there, head down to the ground. I'm like, what the hell? So that's inspiring. Um, and um, no, my, I had my second hip done six months ago. It's coming along really well, and I'm kicking again and doing everything. So I'm feeling really, really, really good. It's uh, mate, you just get on with life, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, Nick but you're, about you're both before, you know. But Nick's, Nick's had broken shin, broken hand, broken that shin, broken dude. Shin. Nick, man, that shin. I, mean, I, reckon, I reckon you love pain, man. I know. It's crazy. Oh man, it's because of all those injuries that I'm just like I I, I don't I go to dark places. Can't in my be fucked mind, anymore. Pain, so yeah, unfortunately. Didn't you? So you because I remember remember you watching a K1 fight and you took you took a bad knee to the face and it fucking <laughs> smashed your nose all over your face. Was yeah. that was that Alexei Ignashov? Yes. What a fucking memory. Nice going, yeah. Terry. He was trying to forget that. <laughs> Sorry uh. to take you back there. Um, so, so was that your first fight? No. That was 2001 in the uh, the, the best eight. That was the, the K1 uh, World Grand Prix in Tokyo Dome. It was my first fight on the night against him. And funny story is I was not training with this boxing coach. Uh, because uh, Kyokushin had hired him to train Francisco. Uh, and we were both in that final. I'd won the, the the Japan Grand Prix and gotten my ticket to go to the Tokyo Dome. Mm-hmm. And Francisco was just there because he was Francisco and he'd knocked everyone else out. Um, and so we were in the same bracket. That means that if we had both won our first fight, we would have fought each other in the second fight, which I was not so keen on. So the trainer that I had um, from America, this boxing trainer, I come over, but then they had pulled Francisco over two months before the fight to, to train with this boxer. Uh, and I was just like, well, if you're going to train Francisco, I don't want you to train me because, you know, I might have to fight Francisco in the second round so you can get fucked. So I was doing my own thing during those days. And then uh, on the day, because I, I had my my team and my Kohai up and helping me in the ring and everything. And I had had a plan because Alex Ignishoff is 
is kind of lazy in the ring. That means he's not like a, a high level. Um, he's not a high uh, volume fighter as he does a lot of techniques. You know, he's kind of not and lazy is not the right word. He's, he's very not smart, dynamic. Very, yeah. He's very like, like, uh, conservative about what he does, but when he does something, it's mm-hmm. pretty much spot on, right? He, he, he susses you out and he'll like, they say he stings with all his scorpion bites. That's why he's called him the red scorpion. Um, he's got great technique, really experienced and really calm in the ring, but which is a great opponent for me because, for someone like me, who's like, you know, low kick, low kick, low kick, um, I will be too fast for him. So I had a great plan. I walked in there with a plan where I was just going to chop him down with low kicks and just like keep my hands up so I don't get fucked up. Anyway, on the day, like five minutes before the fight, this boxing coach that is supposed to be coaching and helping out Francisco in his corner comes into my corner and says, I'm walking into you with the fight. And I was like, no, I don't want you. But I couldn't say no at the time. So I was all confused. You know, wow. I, I was had my game plan. The first round of that fight goes exactly that game plan. I'm talking, chopping him on the legs. I'm hitting him. I'm not getting hit in the face. I'm not boxing him. It's just an, it's me with low kicks against Alex Ignishov. And I was doing good. I was hurting him. I sit down in the corner uh, and after the first round, and this guy is in my face going, you have to box him, man. You have to box him. You're better, this and that. And I'm like, he fucking puts this memory input into my brain. And my brain is like a like a like a dry whatever you call it you know thing that you wash stuff with and it just sucks sponge. everything up. The sponge, yeah. So I was like, "Fuck, man! I, don't tell me to don't tell me to box because I told my kohai, I told him, tell me when I go back after the first round, tell me to low kick, keep low kicking, tell me that my low kicks are doing good. That's all I want to hear. And there's this guy who's out of place, out of everything. He says, "Box, box, box." So I walk into the second round. The first thing I do is start boxing him, and I get my nose broken. Thank wow. you very much. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So teamwork is super important. Um, yeah. Make sure yeah. that you team up with the right person when you're fighting because, you know, it is super important. I learned a big lesson that day. Wow. Yeah. Unfortunately. Any desire to put a <coughs> gi back on? Uh, yeah, yeah, next no, no, year at the I'm, camp in Britain. Aside from yeah, camps, you know, aside yeah. from camps, just in general. <coughs> uh, not really. I, I think that what I learned and what I dedicated myself to in karate is, has given me enough in my life. Um, there's no point for me in going back and doing kata again. Um, I, I, I'm okay with it. It's, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's like getting an, an education in something in some field. And, and Judd and I were educated from Soulside. And it's like that will never leave us. And we still have, even now, I've not, you know, trained in a dojo regularly for more than, yeah, I'd say almost probably 15 years now. Um, and there is nothing that has left me. I could walk in there now and do and know everything. Uh, I might get sore from it if I move right. like I like I used to, but I mean, it's all there. So, yeah, yeah. I prefer on on focusing on the stories and the mentality of it. Um, I'm, I have nothing but respect for what Judd has done in Australia. His dojo is absolutely amazing. I mean, the videos that we see from it, <laughs> the intensity of him teaching, it is absolutely mind blowing. It is beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Do you too feel um, you trained under the man? You were taught by the man. So do you ever feel with all these other Shians that are about now going, do you ever feel like a little air of superiority and be like, listen, I trained under the man. You ain't the man. You haven't got the same uh, appeal to me. No, not at all. No? No, not at all. If everyone's got their own way, you know, wish everyone the best. Everyone's got their dojos, they've got responsibilities, they paying rent, they're paying cancelled rates, they're trying to do the best for the students. As long as you're trying to do the best for your students and what you're doing is authentic and you're doing it in a good manner, in an honourable manner, in a strong manner, then good luck to you. I don't mm. even – that's all I – that's how I look at it. Mm. And everyone, you know, wants to train together and work hard and good sweat out, I just try to keep it simple like that. Yeah. Sweat's the key. Sweat's the key. Sweat's the key. Sweat is the key. Good, mm. honest training. I'm, I might have to make the title of this, Sweat is the Key. Sorry. So what is the, I, mean, the well, um, I, I mean, honestly, uh, when 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 Judd and I were still training in, in in even at home, right? If Judd was running a class, um, and I'd already done a class before that, I would go in there and train in his class. 
if I was running a class and Judd hadn't trained or he'd already trained, was like he would come in and train in my class because, I mean, the way we taught classes at Hombu was so different from any other teacher. It was just, and we loved it. We absolutely loved training. And so when we were running classes, we were inspired by each other's other's classes because that was just the way it is. And I, I, I mean, to be honest, like when Soulsai passes away, it was it was our passion. Uh, we went separate ways. To, you know, just traveled the world. I stayed in Hombu, but but I mean, it was it was that kind of passion that I have yet to see from from other other teachers in Japan. It is non-existent. There was no teacher in Japan that inspired me. Um, uh, Matsui uh, Senpai, for example, was not really teaching at Hombu when he took over the organization and became, you know, the, the new Kancho. Uh, it was not like he was uh, in there working the classes, making sure that everyone was loved and this and that. He was all business, like seriously all business. And for me, when Solsai passed away, um, uh, Kyokushin kind of died for me, for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, if if I had had the chance to find some some teacher that I would be inspired by, I would probably have stuck with it longer. But I, as it ended up, I ended up being my own teacher and leading my own people and, and, and my own uh, dojo for, for many years in Japan. Um, even after we, I got rid of that Yakuza guy um, because he was in so much debt that he got kicked out of the... The place that we were renting from him, um, we we went like a Ronin like band band of brothers around in different places and rented basements and rented time slots and, and gyms and this and that and, and so I, I did it for a long time and I was just like well I'm just not making enough money for me to support my family so I I I chose that way but everything I've learned from karate and everything I've done in karate has helped me um, make my my crossfit business uh, successful so mm-hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I was burnt out. I was I was very burnt out, and I'm happy to just be able to think back about it and the memories and everything that is there for me is is more important than anything else. And if I was in Australia, living in the same city as Judd, I would probably wear a dogi because yeah. someone like him inspires me, you know. But it's yeah. I don't see anyone in Japan where I go, wow, I really want to go and learn from this guy. They just they just don't not there for me. Well said. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the because I've trained with Judd a few times now. And actually, the first time we met, we actually slept together. <laughs> okay, that's a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, Not that there's no, anything I, or great. There's nothing wrong no, with that, Nick. I, I was, so Judd was coming over to London. He was doing a seminar in London. And then he, I was going to London and pick him up. And he was coming to Wales to stay with me and do a seminar in Wales. So I was driving up to London. And I'm like, I don't really want to get a hotel room just to be in there for a couple of hours before we drive back. So I was looking for a place to crash. And Jed was like, well, I'm crash in the hotel with me. And I was like, oh, great, twin room. He said, no, it's a double bed, but it's a big double bed. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> so the first time we actually met, we slept in the bed together. That's very romantic. <laughs> very romantic. <laughs> very romantic. Did you hold hands? Yeah, I my bed. Well, I was holding. Those, I was holding something. I'm not sure. Those if it was are that. pillows. <laughs> <laughs> If uh, yeah, I, go ahead, I forgot how we got onto that. How did we get onto that? I have no idea. I, I was, was going to ask say you guys because we're almost like an hour and a half in. I know you guys have to wrap up soon too. I want to know, um, in terms of your time with society, and we haven't talked too much about society particularly, but is there a particular lesson or what did you what did you derive from so what did you walk away not, not kyokushin specific but what when you uh, you know after he passed away nick you went your direction judd you went yours what from so side did you carry with you that is still with you to this day mm, that's a that's a that's a big question and um a lot of well, you want to make sure I, I put the right uh well you know it's 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 what well, as Nick was saying, before, as we said before, it's not that we learned anything special in class. There was no magic techniques, but it was the way, it was the spirit and the manner which he was, like, the way we were, was part of it. And that, that's that his spirit of give 100%. Um, uh, you, can ach- you can be anything you want to be and, just, mm-hmm. and through life be, re- uh, be relentless and be relentless in your training and 
you and go with all your passion. I mean, with that inspiration in class, that's what I think stuck with Nick and I is that just that that spirit of never giving up, to give it your best in life, and and um, and and that's it. It's always to you know to try your best, and that was that was taught to us in class, and that and that was a big message in life. It was to carry yourself in the same manner. The way we train in class is the way you want to uh, tackle your tackle your life, so to speak. You know, and that was really what yeah. stuck with us. It stuck with me was just give it your best, don't give up, and try your ultimate to to be a good person but to you know as i said before to be a, to be a warrior to go with it uh, to be well, relentless you've, you've, you want to do. you've made it your slogan never give up never give up you know and and that's what we were taught over and over just keep going you know you, you fall over or you just persevere and give it your best you know and just keep it simple like that yeah nick nick doesn't even train anymore <laughs> <laughs> sure, I don't like the pain. It's too painful. <laughs> yeah, but you did. Um, right. Did you have more? Did you have more injuries from CrossFit or from Kyokushin? Come on, I want to hear his answer first. I want to hear. <laughs> this is important. Uh, this is more important. I want to hear cross, what imp- CrossFit, he was imp- CrossFit fucks people up. No, it CrossFit doesn't. Is. I do CrossFit. It does not. Look at you. You've been fucking paralyzed for a month. Can't move. No, not because of CrossFit. Anyway, that's CrossFit. <laughs> Go on, Nick. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I love this question. Um, CrossFit is is not made or designed to fuck people up. Exactly. It is competitive sport again that fucks you up, and that's the same with martial arts. Once you go competitive sport, that will fuck you up, no matter whatever sport it is. And CrossFit competitive people are absolutely nuts, and I hate them, and I don't sanction what they do. I have never done competitive CrossFit, and over the last now 10 years of doing CrossFit, I've had two injuries, Um, Mm -hmm. and they came from the same uh, scenario. One was when I was doing a 90-kilo push press with a barbell over my head. Uh, A a muscle in my shoulder literally bursts. It just went, (laughs) Um, why? Because I'm chasing one more rep. I'm chasing something Mm -hmm. heavier. Like Again, it's ego. the other Isn't that interesting. That Sorry to go into your second one. Isn't it interesting that most injuries like that come from ego? <laughs> oh, they're all ego. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Sorry. It's like go on. You you're competing with someone. It, either it's yourself or it's the other guy on the yeah. floor or whatever. It, it's and the second time I did an injury was I was trying to squat clean 115 kilos with my two replaced hips, which is absolutely retarded, right? Why am I trying to lift this? Because I, I cleared 112 kilos. So I was like, yeah, I'll do 115, yeah. right? So I get the 115 kilo up on the bar. I'm pulling it up. It gets up. It lands on my shoulders. And then I slip somehow in my fingers. And then the barbell pulled my wrist back. And I thought I'd broken my wrist. Jesus. This is stupid injuries. These are but two injuries that I've had out of CrossFit. I've had 17 broken bones and six operations uh, from martial arts. So which is more? Definitely huh. from martial arts. I think uh, I think you was I think you was doing the martial arts wrong. <laughs> I was, I was actually. This is think true. You were doing I went it. all in. But man, what you, about you have you? no idea. You have no idea what what Judd and I did. The way we trained, because we trained how we fought, and we right. did that every day, every but day. This is what I was going to say to you. But that's not sustainable, both, though. That is not sustainable. sustainable. You're both <laughs> relatively young, and both had to have new hips. Do you think that's from your time training in Humble? Of course born, it is. No, I, I'm born with with uh, small uh, hip sockets. My brother also had one of his hips replaced, and he has to have the other one replaced. So we're born naturally with uh, sockets that are not big enough to ca- to carry the femur. So mm. they're only half. So all that training and all that moving yeah. just wears them down. We would have worn out regardless of doing martial arts or not. Uh, I, I don't Jed, know you, you, you got small sockets, Jack. Oh, I think that doing some. Of, I think doing some of the techniques. I think. Uh, from Furudachi, doing Mawashigiri like this, I don't think it's good for your hips. No, you have you, 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 know, you know, you know, you know, you see the Muay Thai fighters. They would, if you see the Muay Thai fighters, they cannot stand there and do Mawashigiri on the spot. They would look, they look funny. Everything they yeah. do is kicking through the target, so there's no shaving of the hip. We sh- in Kyokushin, yeah. when we do that, it's a lot of shaving. Bang, 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 bang. Good, Where yeah. Muay Thai, is boom, and they don't have any hip replacements or any hip problems at all when. The fighter. So you look, you know, yeah. So I think maybe some of these things that we did have a little bit of contribution to 
Mm. Yeah, to bring it back, Scott, to bring it back to your question of what is what is the most important thing that Soulsai taught me, mm. and um, it is a it is a mindset, um, it is an understanding of the bigger picture of what it is that you that drives you uh, through your life, um, the the whole uh, serving Soulsai and 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 being there, um, looking at the bigger picture, like in small situations where you see what's going on. Uh, anticipating your senpai's moves and everything uh, taught me everything I need uh, to be a businessman today. So um, yeah, everything mm. is connected. Because I think uh, pe people awesome. forget as well, Sosai, the, the brilliant karateka, was also a brilliant businessman as well. He was a pretty the good organization. <laughs> yeah, the organization that he created uh, and Media 8, that, that sort of company as well of getting the message out there to Kyokushin. He was a very, very clever and ahead of his time guy in terms of that he built yeah. an empire it's crazy man he yeah, built a cult built empire. for sure mm. and the legacy still lives on anything that you know the people that have, uh, like judd and i are, are fortunate we spent three years with sosa um, yeah. on a daily basis you know he would talk to us on a daily basis we would uh, uh drive with, in his car with him to his house uh, to bodyguard him um we would you know, be there for anything, you know, taking care of the dojo or scrubbing the floors, washing the toilets, uh, you know, we're doing all these things. And, and and in the middle of it, you're thinking, why am I doing all this shit? I'm just like, I'm just like scrubbing around and, and, and cleaning toilets. This is like, it doesn't make any sense. But then you get to spend time with Sosa and he would come in and he would talk to us and he would teach us specifically just the Uchideshi class. It was only for us. Mm. Um, so we're, we're very, very privileged to have spent all this time with Sosa. And because of that, uh, and because of, of people like Judd and I, when when we see and we experience and we train together, you know, we we feed off that energy and wanting to become the best student of Sosa. Right. And I I think that if Judd had not been there for as a senpai for me for the first two years, <clears throat> I would never have uh, I would never have grown into the fighter I did end up becoming one day. Um, it was simply because of that rivalry, but also camaraderie and brotherhood. So, you know, it's, it's like a, a double-edged sword, you know, where we become friends, we become brothers over the years of training together. And, and it's not just the training. It is like, we literally lived for one thing was to become better at, at, at karate. Like every conversation we had was about fighting or, or about mm. the training that we did everything and we'd lie up until late at night and just like you know talk but we would be talking about karate all day long <laughs> i swear the first time i went back to denmark after i graduated and met my brother and family and it was just like they they didn't know they didn't know who i was it was like and i didn't know who anyone else was i had i had nothing to talk about with these people <laughs> my family um so yeah it took me a good yeah it took me a good three four years to like you know what do you call it? Like weave into like reassimilate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think that? Do you think that's why Nick you wanted to go back to Japan when you went back to Denmark? You didn't fit into the society, so everything you did, this you just felt like something was. Yeah, you needed to go oh, back. Man, to Japan, I, right? I did a class in Denmark, right? I did a, one class in Denmark, and we and they pulled out the pads, and we were doing low kicks on pads, and then this black belt in Denmark was holding the pads and I was kicking him low kicks. Okay. That was a very strong kicker back in the day. <laughs> this I will admit, but I dropped him while he was holding the pad. Like he, he, he couldn't take the punishment from the low kicks. And then his mom calls me up and said that I'm abusing his, 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 his her son. And I was like, he's holding pads, <laughs> the black belt. And his mom is calling me up and complaining. And I'm getting like yelled at. I never went back to the dojo. I was just like, I'm done. I, I can't do this. Like, it's just like, I was also at a different level, but I was like, I'm not fucking going back there. And so I couldn't wait to get back to Japan. Oh, wow. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I couldn't wait to get back. So I think we need to wrap yeah. this up, Terry. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's been, I think it's been fantastic. Um, I just worry yeah, about, and, is, and I know Judd's got to go, and I worry Judd, about it. you got to go? <laughs> I've got to go. Yeah. Right. Let's wrap it up. It, it's been a fantastic show, which is why we wanted yeah. you both on, because awesome. we both know the story. We know Judd's story. We know Nick's story. And we wanted to get you together to, uh, so we can see side by side the different views. Part one. Part yeah, one. Probably part one. <laughs> 
No, no, no. to talk about. We, we could do this again. We could do oh, this again yeah. in a couple of weeks' time. I could stay on it for another two hours with a bathroom break. <laughs> oh, it's been and, a great glass of whiskey yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Well, we all, yeah, we all, we we're all in mind. Yeah, let's let's make different stories. That next one will be uh, the, uh, the 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 evening time for Nick and I, so we can have yes. a few beers. The early morning for you, but, and you'll hear different stories again. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but we definitely should come on with a theme, though. I like the idea of coming on. We'll t- talk about one specific topic or theme. That'd be pretty cool too. Well, yeah, sure. Awesome. Thank uh, you guys to talk to you guys. so much, man. I can't. By the, believe- by the time this you. show is coming out, when are you going to air this? It's up to you know what I'm. I was. What do you guys think? Terry and I had talked about doing releasing it Monday, but I'm so excited. I want to release it tomorrow. What do you guys? We'll get it out as soon as you can, if you want. I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, I'll, I'll edit it up tonight yeah. and get it yeah, out. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Just want to say one shout out that um, tomorrow here in Japan time on Saturday the fifth, I am uh, airing the first show of a new YouTube channel called Junk Food Japan. Awesome. Awesome. So if you guys want to see a, what crazy foods you can get in Japan, I have started wow. a new channel. And uh, yeah, it's pretty excited Nick, about it. That's you've cool. Got about, that. You've got about 10 fucking YouTube channels. <laughs> yeah, I know. But this is this is a professionally <laughs> produced channel. It's like, it's a real channel. Like oh, everything else is just me fucking around. <laughs> yeah. So tune into that, guys. Anything um, from your side, Judd? Sorry? Anything from your side? Anything shout outs or announcements or anything? Shout out no, I was just going to say, great to talk to you all, guys. Scott, and Nick, and Terry, thank you so much for your time, boys. I know you're busy, Nick. It's awesome to hear your stories. You still inspire me, mate. Just the vice versa. You said that uh, we had a, a, an incredible journey as youngsters, and I couldn't have done it without you, too. I just want to let you know that, too, mate. You mean the world to me. Scott and Terry, you guys are awesome what you're doing for the Chokushin in the martial art community, putting out your podcast there. They're enjoyable, they're laughable, they're inspiring, they've got everything that you know that that we uh that is great about a podcast. So good on you guys and congratulations on your gift gift go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Looking forward well, to chatting you again. Awesome. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. I think it's been a fantastic show. There's loads for you to take on there, and we've got loads more stories to come in the future. So don't forget to do all your bits like subscribe and share the fuck out of this one <laughs> yeah and uh Oof. we catch you on the Oof. next one guys all right boys Cut. thanks boys Oof. Good. Oof. good on you boys Oof. <laughs>